ROC is welcome. I've never told anyone this story. B17. Rural, but a street urchin. Spend my days skipping school and exploring the mountains surrounding my valley town. Find a little house about a mile from the McDonald's. Up in the woods, no power lines, no road. Really old. I would almost call it a cabin but it was definitely a house. Go inside, find a lot of stuff still there. Old green plastic cards table, matching puke green plush vinyl chairs. One room is a study, library. Walls are lined with bookshelves. Mostly Reader's Digest collected works and National Geographics. Some old college textbooks from the 50s, various paperbacks, pulp novels, and a full set of encyclopedias. Pretty nice swing back chair, side table, there was a couch but it was too decayed to sit in. Pretty comfy. JPG. Start coming back most days, just hanging out and reading, enjoying the silence. Scoping some African tribal titties in Nat Geo. Hear a rustling something fierce. Figure it's a possum or something, go to check it out. See a short little shadow, think it's a possum for sure. Take cold McNuggets out of pocket, toss one on the ground near the door to the kitchen where I see the shadow. Silence. I blink and the nugget is gone, blink again and it's thrown against the wall, outside the kitchen doorway. Splatters, covering me in cold nugget juice. Library door shuts behind me. Poop a little dot x. Spooked, start power walking to the front door, trying to pretend like I didn't even notice. Heard somewhere that spooks want your attention so I tried to just act like nothing was happening. As I pass through the hallway swear I see someone behind me in the mirror on the wall. As I pass through the living room a bunch of soot and dust plumes out of the fireplace. Whole house seems to tremble as I walk out the door. MFW I tried to feed a poltergeist a McNugget. MFW I think it was mad cause it was old. MFW I should have been more considerate and brought it a happy meal. Y'all wanna hear some shit? Be me. At friend's graduation party let's call him Bran. His family is here from east side of country Iqua state. We get on the topic of camping or some shit. His uncle pipes up hey Bran, remember our run in with the goat man? MFW. He continues to tell us story. Bran is visibly distressed. Bran and uncle at hiking back east. Come across a bloody t-shirt. Too spooky for them. Take off for their house. They get back to house. My friend gets sick all over their patio from smell. His fucking words. Copper and blood. They saw a figure in tree line later that evening. I ask his uncle on the side if the phrase cheeky breaky or slash k slash mean anything to him in the least autistic way possible. Says no and gives me weird look. MFW my best friend was almost killed by a skinwalker. Sup slash x slash. Share your desert stories. Live in Vegas. Doing paper route at 4 a.m. in neighborhood at the very edge of the city. Driving normally delivering papers and whatnot. I see rabbits whatever. As I keep driving I see this thing. The head of a rabbit with a coyote like body. It was also bigger than a coyote. WTF is that? Honk at it. Runs away back into the desert. Would. Also that same night as I'm driving back home. I see a flashing light moving around the mountains. Black mountain for anybody that lives in Vegas, the light moved straight across the mountain. Greater than driving through Texas panhandle desert, there's it everywhere. Greater than lonely freeway. Greater than sea exit. Pull off to stretch legs at old closed down gas station dust blowing around, armadillo with a tire track through its backo inside gas station because looks creepy and see old food and candy wrappers gross old sleeping bag bent and beat up issues of hustler and other skin mags start to feel like somebody is watching note back to the jeep and keep driving. Live in LA. Decide to take a day off from work and go with GF to a national park. It's Joshua Tree even hotter than forecast. 
daytime see cars on the road now and then. Fun camping site. We forgot the tent. Fuck it well sleep in the car. 104 Fahrenheit outside the car. Even hotter inside. Roll windows down partway. Sun goes down. Temperature stays the same. Can't see a foot outside the window only stars if I try nothing else. Darkness and heat keep pressing in. I have this terrible feeling that I do not want to sleep with the windows down. That there's something waiting. Put shoes and shirt back on. Jump to front seat roll windows up start the car and AC. Hear a crash near the dumpster for the camping area. Shit we hob to pass the dumpster to get back in the road. Start droving the fuck out of there. Bat hits hits my windshield as I passed the dumpster. Made me jump. GF wondering why I was on edge. Tell her to go back to sleep I'll drove us back home. Not going back there anytime soon. So, here's my story. When I was 8, my dad decided to drive east to see a couple of his friends, right across the Nullarbor Plain. He took me and my sister with him, because when is that not a good idea right? So it was 7 days in a car, nothing else. Well, 4 days into the trip I start getting really sick. I get sick like this every time I travel but, having never traveled before, back then I wasn't sure what was happening to me. So, it would be, every rest stop, I would vomit my guts up, and shit whatever was fluid out of me too. It was horrible. My dad decided that it was better to continue on to seeing his friends rather than turn back, since about now we were closer to their city than to ours and if I needed to they could take me to a hospital in Tumbrumba. So, incredibly gymped now as I had to stop every two hours to puke, we kept going. Now, on day four I had stopped four times already and it had set us way back. It was maybe 10 pm and we were still a long way away from the next town but not too far out. We had just stopped a sign that say it was maybe 50k away when we saw something sitting on the side of the road. It looked really gross, kind of deflated but god was it huge. My dad didn't want to stop but I was feeling the need to vomit so he decided to check it out while my sister sat in the car and I made a mad dash for the closest short, scraggly bush. Even from a good 20 meters from the road, I could smell the carcass. It was like fresh death, still a little bloody. But definitely decomposing. As it so happens, this night was the night my body gave out on me. I had been dehydrated for at least a day and a half now and apparently trying not to howl as cramps overtook me was the last straw, because I collapsed and started convulsing. For a few seconds, I was aware still, and I lay on my side kicking up the biggest fuss, before I blacked out. When I came to my dad was standing over me, his breath shaking and eyes panicked. Apparently it had been several minutes before he had realized I was not okay, and came running straight for me. I couldn't move by this point, so I just gibbered incoherently for a second, trying to sit up and not cry as I realized I had made a mess of myself. As I sat up, I saw behind my dad. The massive, rotting carcass stood up. It was like watching a newborn foal, it was shaky and its legs were spindly. In fact, it looked very similar to a horse, with a long face and neck, but its skin hung limp and its fur was covered in ica. My dad noticed my glazed stare, and he turned too. I heard his gasp. The creature, however, appeared to not notice, as we were well out of the car's headlights. It took a few stumbling steps, and, tail swishing, disappeared into the blackness on the other side of the road. My dad carried me to the car, practically running, and instead of letting me change out there I had to while the car was running. My sister had been asleep the whole time. When I asked him about when we reached his friend's place, he said that the thing had definitely been dead, there were marks where something, maybe a dingo or feral dog, had been chewing on it, and he had seen fly pupae on the lips and nose of it. I can tell you now, we were so fucking careful on our trip back. Didn't matter how sick I was, and yes, I got sick on the way back, we never stopped after dark. I've had absolutely zero luck with creepy shit. An old co-worker claims to have twice seen some big dude standing randomly at the store after hours. As it turns out the old owner of said shop was a big dude and committed suicide. This co-worker of mine wasn't hired until a couple of years after that. What buildings are you referring to? I haven't had any business down there, so no. The idea of the basements connecting to other buildings is strange enough. Most of the clustered buildings are connected. 
back when I first started and the first time I did a job downtown, I had absolutely no idea that the buildings had underground tunnels. Not small tunnels, huge. Big enough that it was difficult to really tell where one building ended and the other began. To make a long story short, I got lost and ended up across the street and two buildings down. I was curious about the tunnel so I did a bit of research. Turns out that back when the railroads were being built, the Chinese people were forced to live underground, since they were seen as less. So they essentially had their own little underground city. Cleaned out. This was back in the late 1800s. The city has also blocked off several passages. Bums live down there too, but they stay near the rail yard and stay away from the buildings for the most part. Guess I'll share one of my many strange experiences in green text. Get called out to do install in Lower Valley, ghetto. Have to install second phone line in really old lady's room. Lady is really creepy. Has a bunch of brujeria crap in her room. She's talking to herself the entire time I'm in there. Working as fast as possible. She stops talking and stares at me. Starts telling me they like you. I freak out but stay cool and professional. I humor her in thanks and smile. She says, you can't hear them? I smile and nod. Finally finish and go. Coolies. I'll post the ones that I have that are relevant, military. I grew up a military brat, so I've been around on a few bases but haven't had as much paranormal experiences on them as I have just living in civilian places. Anyway, I'll tell you about a little place. In Sasebo, Japan. Little housing base called Hario. A shrine is located right outside the gates to the base, Tour says it is a shrine for good luck or some shit. Locals, including mother, says entirely untrue. Apparently the whole base used to be a hospital for those from World War II with untreatable diseases of the time, many people died and were buried there. Said when the Americans decided to put their base there, all the bones were dug up and put in the shrine, to appease the spirits. Not all bones have been uncovered and it isn't unusual to stumble upon one every now and then. Now, I don't remember too much about living in Hario, by the time we moved back to Japan my dad was a civilian contractor and we just lived in a regular apartment building. But my mom remembers and she absolutely hates the place. Here's a story I can remember she would tell me. Be mom. Be stay at home mom, older Browski off at the Skoolis, home with the baby and dogs. Distract baby and on with toys, get up to grab a drink from the kitchen. Gone for no longer than 20 seconds when baby starts screaming. Rush back, see nothing majorly amiss. Check baby over. Human teeth marks on baby's inner thigh. Nope to friend's house, show them the marks, refuse to come home until husband is back from work. That's pretty weird. Never heard of baby eating ghosts slash spirits. It surely wasn't one of your dogs. I guess you can clearly see the difference, just making sure it wasn't. As far as I heard, spirits of humans actually continue what they used to do in their living days or in their moments of death, smokers still smoke and people who died under pain are still crying slash screaming and stuff, you get me. Can't think of a real reason why they would bite a baby, except cannibalism. Not saying this is a real thing and all, but assuming these theories might be right. Possibly. I don't even know how many fucking yukai there are but there's plenty enough to go around. Anyway, since we're in Japan, I'll tell you guys about the Nihonzo, it's in Shimabara, on the island of Kyushu. Shimabara is pretty famous for that disastrous eruption some years back killed a lot of people and even a portion of the city has been preserved to showcase the tragedy. Anyway, the Nihonzo is a giant statue of Buddha sleeping, attaining enlightenment, basically, and it's located in a huge ass cemetery. Anyway. Be me, a handful of years ago. Visiting Shimabara with family, cause we like to travel and see things. Mom really spiritual, wants to see Nihonzo. Sure, what else is there to do in Shimabara? Walking through the huge cemetery. Didn't realize this statue was in a cemetery, this is strange for a Buddhist statue. Find it, mom in awe, I'm bored and wander off. 
pass by several mourners dressed all in black, think nothing of it. Keep eyes lowered and looking at some of the graves. Finally look up at grave, notice someone standing behind it. Wearing all black, mourner. Why are they behind the grave? Why is their head bowed? Look around, see the whole row of graves have people in black behind them. Think, shit, creeped out, seeing things again, nope nope nope. Mom finds me, asks why I have a strange look on my face. Ask her about the mourners we passed by. What mourners? No one is here but us, the priests aren't even out here. Explain to mom what I saw. She tells me not to talk to anyone until we are out of the cemetery. Also, while we were there, we walked around and found a really old and really successful sake factory. I took one look at this building and was so overcome with a sense of dread and malice I refused to go near it and has to stand on the street opposite it while my dad checked it out. When my mom asked what was wrong, I explained how the building just looked, intimidating and threatening, she nodded her head and said there was probably an ONI living in the factory. I don't know if I believe it, but my mom was one of those stereotypical old Japanese ladies who were very superstitious, and I was the only one of the family interested enough to hear her out on these things. I've been told by a number of people reading my stories that they didn't find any of them scary at all. There is really no mystery here. That's because those people have never been in the woods before. If they had, they would know what I'm talking about when I talk about feeling something watching me or that I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. Even the Army Sniper Handbook notes that you should avoid staring directly at your target as this can make them aware of your presence. This fear is an instinct coded into our genes at a very basic, primeval level. Back before we had fire, back before we knew we could use rocks, sticks, and cord to make weapons and tools, back before we knew that thunder and the dark were natural phenomena, our ancestors had to react in order to survive. Those who didn't run and hide quick enough, those who lacked the primal fear, they didn't make it. Their genes are lost forever in presumably horrible events too gruesome for our minds to fathom today. Every person who has ever ventured out into nature has felt their blood run cold at least once. That is proof that everybody alive today still has the same instincts that kept our ancestors alive and out of trouble. And by nature, I don't mean some shitty campground in a state park with RV hookups. Nature is not a subjective concept that you can trick yourself into seeing. It's either you're there or you're not. Go take a few camping trips out to the deep woods, far from gas stations, paved roads, and cell phone towers. Go to the places that humanity has not yet conquered. Go to the places that civilization has abandoned. Go out to the places where you will only see other people on the trail itself, and to leave the trail means to give up a valuable lifeline of social and emergency support leading back to civilization. We all take that for granted every day in our connected urban or suburban worlds we call home. When you're out there in the woods by yourself, wait until about an hour before sundown, Step off the trail, and walk far enough away from it that you can't hear any voices of people who might be on the trail. Listen to the woods for the first time in your life. Actually listen and observe the forest for what it is, not for your preconceptions of the sounds that you think should be there, songbirds, owls, crickets, or squirrel chatter. When twilight, heightened by the tree cover above, comes, pull out your little book with these stories written in it. Turn on your headlamp and point it at the book so the light reflecting off the white pages ruins your night vision and all around you is pitch black. I guarantee that you'll be shitting yourself in five minutes. Not as much to tell as you'd like to think, but long forming because I hate green text. Quick background, Eagle Scout, most of my camping brothers are from Scouts, Cascade Ranges on the western side are temperate, wet, remote. Hobos and squatters slash in a woodsman are more common than you'd think. We were about 15 miles out from Trailhead, heading south from Hui too. Crashed hard at a little Caldera Lake. Pretty, remote. Made camp late, and we were tired as fuck. Only a couple guns with us, little 9 shot .22 revolver, 1.357 revolver. Five of us, 17 to 24 in age set up the tents about 150 yards from the waterline. Nightfall, and it's a cold camp. High fire risk, K-1 
campfire is banned, and we're still comparatively close to the trailhead so we didn't want to get busted. Two tents. Me and B in one tent, T, D, L in the other. We're used to the usual wood sounds. Small mammals running over the tent walls, skittery noises from the bushes. Some cougar in the area, some black bear, but we've never seen any. It had to have been about 0300 when mine and B's tent shakes. It woke us both up. It wasn't a wind shake, this was someone grabbing one of the poles and shaking the fuck out of it. We yell, laughing, telling what we thought was the guys from the other tent shaking ours to knock it the fuck off. It keeps up for a good 10 seconds after we start yelling. B grabs his flashlight, says he's gonna fucking kill them if they rip his tent. Zips open the door, nothing. Let me be clear. He opens the door, we're in a clearing about 40 feet across, and we see nothing. T zips open his tent asking what the hell is going on. You can hear those zippers moving in the middle of the night, very, very clearly. I see him open it. I see his face. None of us see anything in the clearing, no tracks, no sign of a person. B and I are freaked. T, D, L, R. Confused but nervous. We talk it over, figure it was a raccoon and we missed it, and isn't anything to worry about. We go back to sleep around 0330. I remember this next part really fucking well. I had just drifted off, the tent starts shaking again. This wasn't like before, this was like someone had grabbed both poles, dending the fabric down and in, near the top. The only way to do that and not dent in the tent we had was to be at least 6 feet tall, with a decent reach. The tent is shaking all over the place. B wakes up, shines his light, I see the dents, I yell something about motherfucker I see you knock that shit off. It continues until B slaps the tent up near the top. Nothing. Instant stop. No noise. D hollers, something about us shaking his tent. B opens the flap, white as a sheet. T opens his, white as hell. None of us see shit. Other than the tent shaking. None of us here shit. Right. Okay. Trixie fucking wood hobo. We can't get out of there at night. Cloud cover, in a long valley rise coming up between two mountains. Darker than fuck. Figure whoever it is, he's wanting to scare us off. I get to be the brave one, and yell something about, we're leaving at daylight, let us be and we'll let you be, we're armed, and we aren't playing. D and L scavenge some downed branches, because fuck this shit, we're scared and cold, build a quick fire. They don't need to leave the clearing, and we're keeping an eye out. Build a little fire, all of us up the rest of the night until daybreak. We're packed and out of there so fucking fast that we're on the trail, guns in hand before we can really see a damn thing. On the ride out, back to the main highway, we start comparing notes. And that's when we start getting those spine chills. There was no way that we could have missed a man, much less two, shaking those tents in the clearing. There was no way it was a coon, there was no way it was a mouse, and there was no way in hell it was any of us fucking with the others. We don't talk about it much, and we've never gone back to that trail. Another creepy experience from one of my customer installs. Get a job downtown at an old folks home hate doing jobs downtown and I haven't had a pleasant experience stealing the older folks in homes. Main phone terminal is in the basement of course. Look around and can't find it, so I ask the maintenance man. He says it's in the sub-basement. Damn it. He shows me the way but refuses to come with me. I have to do it, so I clear my head and try not to let my imagination run away. Dark and hot as hell loud furnace type things everywhere. Turn the corner and see pictures of Jesus everywhere. White candles all of the place. Rosary beads hanging everywhere. See a neon Jesus painting on black velvet. Well now and it eases my mind while I do what I have to down there. Nothing scary happened down there, but the fact that the maintenance man flat out refused to go down there along with all the religious protective type things kinda gave it a really creepy vibe. I'm no military dude, but here's a story of an experience I had in Portland, Oregon. Delivery driver, deliver goods to restaurants. 
go to a restaurant on east side of river. Creepy old building, long stairway down to basement. Creepy basement, creepy door in the middle of the stairway, too. Unloading goods in the basement one day. Hear female softly sing. A little startled. Thought it was someone else, or maybe sound traveled. Realize I'm the only one in the basement. Only one prep cook upstairs, male. Hum to myself, pretty much throw delivery in place. Run upstairs. Prep cook says I look startled. Tell him that basement is creepy. He proceeds to tell me that there are really two official basements, and one unofficial one. Back in 1800s, building was a mortuary. First basement was embalming, second storage. Prep cook walks down stairwell, opens door in middle of stairwell. Dilapidated crematorium inside. Eventually, building becomes the saloon. Unofficial, third basement part of Shanghai tunnels. Apparently, Shanghai tunnels are on both sides of river. Although building is relatively close to river, Prep Cook tells me the tunnels extend much further than river area. Creepy shit. It's now a bang. Well, I'm obviously back and anticipating more stories and did promise to share some more, so I'll go ahead and post my mother's most prominent story. The reason she always quotes to me why she hates every horror movie I ever watch and will not watch ghost movies with me. I'm sorry if it reads like a cliché Asian horror, but to be honest that is what it is as its heart, and the pure terror and abhorrence my mother shows whenever she speaks of it, as well as the weird look my skeptic dad gets if I ask him about the incident in question, tells me that at the very least, whatever did go down long ago, my mom believes she truly lived in a haunted house. Alright. This was a while back, before my parents had children, and were actually living together. My father is in the Navy, my mother a typical stay-at-home wife. They had just moved to Yokosuka, taking along their three dogs and bird, and were searching for a home. They found one in a place called Kitakuro-ama, in a nice house several houses away from the temple and cemetery. Now, when they first moved in, my mom felt that something was a little off about the place. But, she was young. She was married and planning for a family, and this was a nice big place. Needless to say, she felt the good outweigh the bad, and soon it was theirs and they'd settled. Well, as the Navy goes, my father was deployed, but not without some good news. She became pregnant before he was due to see, and according to my mom, that's when shit hit the fan. With my father gone and a new baby to get ready for, the first tragedy was this, Poco, second dog, pup of the first dog, full grown, not even middle aged, and Pai Chan, the bird died. At the same time, on the same day. A little strange, but coincidence, right? Well, days, maybe weeks, I'm not sure, my mom doesn't remember, pass, and the second event comes in. One day, my mom notices the strangest of things, the fridge is sweating. She called it sweating anyway. According to her, water was pouring out of the fridge. Of course, one thinks malfunction but when my mom opens the thing to check, all was well. There was ice, there was cold, all the veggies and meats were good. But water was pouring out of the outer fridge like no tomorrow, she spent the whole day using towels to try and wipe the fridge dry to no avail. When she called for technician or something of that sort to check it out the next day, there was nothing wrong with it. In fact, after that day, the fridge sweated no longer. This, of course, thoroughly puzzled my mother, but the next hurdle was the one that made her fear. My mother had a gas stove of old back then, that required one to turn on the gas, which was linked to a major gas pipe connecting the whole block, or something along those lines. So that, if something were to go wrong, the whole block experiences the fritz, and start a spar to light the stove. Anyway, she planned to go out that morning to buy groceries, and did the usual of checking to make sure things are turned off, doors are secured, pets are safe. And off she goes. Upon returning, she knows something is wrong. This wrong, of course, is a funny smell permeating about the house. Alerted to something strange. She retreats from the house to go to a neighbor's, where she asks to use the phone. I'm not sure how my mother knew who to call, 
but someone did figure out the gas was on in my mother's house and told her to throw open every door and window. Wait several hours to let the gas clear out. Of course, they follow instructions, and later that day, or the next day, I don't know, an inspector comes. As he searches the pipes and checks for leaks, he's puzzled. The gas was confirmed to be turned off the whole time, and yet, no leak was found. Odder still, if something had gone wrong with the main pipe, everyone on the block would have suffered, however, it was just my mother whose house filled with gas. He left with no answer for my mom. Now scared, from both her experiences and a spot of bleeding, making her worry she might have a miscarriage again, my aunt volunteers to stay with her for a little. Grateful, my mother accepts the offer, and my aunt soon moves in to stay a few weeks with my mom to help run things. It is during this stay that the only sighting happens. My mom often recalls my aunt asking her in the morning what she was doing up late at night. Each time, my mom was confused and denied ever being up. Eventually, my aunt confessed that late at night, she would hear footsteps roaming the halls. When she got up to investigate, she would see the silhouette of a woman with long hair, which generally more or less summed up my mother's shadow in a dark hall at the time which scared my mom, as she has never been one to sleep walk, and she didn't know of anyone aside from her and my aunt in the house. This unsettles my aunt as well, who is glad to leave when she does, when she feels things are fine with my mom, shadow, in the hall aside. Now that my mother is alone, she's afraid of the house. She's afraid of what's in it and does not want to be home alone. My father is still out at sea but is due to return in just a short period so my mom resorts to begging an uncle to stay. He agrees, at least for a day, and comes and settles in for the night. He asks my mom to sleep close to the kuditsu, it's a type of heater set into the underside of a table, the top can come off so that a blanket can be set over the table kinda like a tablecloth to keep the warmth of the heater centered around the table, to keep warm, it's fall and she agrees to his request. However, being paranoid of fires, after she sets up his futon and the kitatsu, she folds up the blanket usually kept draped over the kitatsu and puts it atop the table. As well, she keeps the setting on low, just in case. Bidding good night to each other, they sleep. In the morning, when my mother goes to greet my uncle, he is furious. He demands to know why my mother tried to kill them all, and why she's acting so crazy. Rather lost. My mom implores an explanation from the angry uncle to learn that, after going to bed, my uncle awoke to find the kitatsu a fire hazard. The blankets had been stuffed under the table, pretty much all over the heater, and the heater set upon its highest setting. My mother denied ever doing that, using my uncle's memory of seeing her prep everything for him the evening earlier, and both were very unsettled. Needless to say, my uncle left and refused to return. Finally, the day arrives, dad comes home. Glad to no longer be stuck in the house on her own, she tells my dad of all the things that has happened. He waves it off as imagination or something rational, he's never been one to believe in paranormal. Though he does enjoy stories of it, he just views it all with a skeptical eye, thinking that maybe whatever's in the house will go away with the return of my father, my mom allows herself to get comfortable. Of course, foolish notion. When night fell and they were drifting to sleep, they heard the strangest noise. A sort of click clack click clack, like high heels on the roof. This woke up my mom, who then woke my dad, to confirm the noises were, well, real. He agreed he too was hearing them, and being the man, said he'd check it out. To the attic he goes, checking windows and the like for a sign of this stranger walking on their roof in heels. When he comes back down, he seems pretty confused. He tells my mom that the attic, a place they had not been to since they moved in some months before was clean. Spotless. Not a speck of dust, nor a web. Nor was there anyone upon the roof. After this, my mom had enough. She demanded to move. When my father refused to budge, she put it terms he would understand. The house was going to kill her, or drive her to the brink of insanity and kill her unborn baby. This, of course, made my dad realize just how serious his wife was, 
and my dad applied to be transferred and managed to get their asses out of there. Here's the thing, as they were preparing to move, the neighbors, an elderly couple native to the area from what I gather, approached my mom, asking if she were moving. When she let them know that yes, she was, they spilled the beans. That people who moved into that house never stayed for longer than a year dot 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 since the last owner of the house hung herself after finding out she was pregnant. Used to live in deep south, devil's armpit, Texas. Friends and I had nothing to do but go derp around in a desert. One night be us just chillin' up in a mesquite tree. Because dot 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 there be javelinas at here yo. Friends starts saying he hears a sound. We all start to listen. Suddenly we hear a blood curdling scream. My three friends scream I Dios mio, cross themselves. What? SLA Lorona, run, crin. They all run the fuck off, leaving me, still just assuming it was just someone messing with us. Be about a mile away from home. On the trail about to cross a small creek. Hear the same scream. Not nip nip nope. Run like Forrest Gump, whole way home. Be in middle school. Be Mexican. Parents decide to take road trip down to Mexico to visit family. Long gas boring drive dot JPG. Nothing but brown hat desert. Few days in Mexico. Still a long ways to go. To save money we decide to sleep in the car on the side of the road. One day we're driving down road. No cars to be seen. Part no the side of road for sleep. Feel spooky, JPG. See some lights from car coming our way. It passed us. Car keeps going and then stops. Starts to turn around. Starts heading our way. Dad freaks out. No town nearby for hours. Half asleep he starts the car and we're off. Car speeds up and follows us for a bit. Keeps following us for an hour or so till we get to the pay road toll. Car stops when we get to the toll booth and turns around going the other way. Shit was pretty spooky bro. Used to live in Vegas. Go to west outskirts of Vegas. This was before that bit of land got contracted out and fenced up. The view is amazing. Decide to look around me. Pretty dark which is odd because it's still in that zone where it's never fully night. See what is best described as an 8-10 foot tall scarecrow, with massive shoulders and pointed head about 100 meters away. Like it was wearing full-on KKK regalia. Whatever, I'm hallucinating, or it's a scarecrow. Look back to the city. Fucking baller. Hear something snap in the distance, silent otherwise. Odd because it's not that far from houses. Look behind me. It's closer, maybe 90 meters away. Whatever the fuck it was moved its arm and pointed at me. No end. Nope. Also, went back the next day. No scarecrow, nothing. Just dirt. Be me at 15. 2008. Driving with dad throughout back. Driving the plenty. Donahue Highway, between the Stewart Highway in the Northern Territory and Bia in Western Queensland. Till to 700 kilometers and sealed road. See no one but a few trucks, maybe three in total the whole time. Blew two tires about 450 kilometers in and didn't have any more spares so had to drop our speed by a lot just to be safe. As a result end up taking much longer to drive the length of this road than we otherwise would have. For background, there is a myth, legend in the Bia area of this so-called Min Min light that harasses and follows travelers and tries to entice them to leave the road at night and follow it out into the desert. We traveled in the area plenty of times before and had never seen it, so we weren't really thinking about it. Be about 8.30 p.m., pretty dark, night sky out there was amazing BTW, any Australians here I highly recommend. Driving along at about 50 to 60 km per hour to prevent any risk of another tire blowing. Light flashes in front of us like a shooting star, but right in front of the windshield. Dad and I WTF but keep on driving. Happens a few more times. 
starts to hang around a bit longer each time. At one point it hovered in front of us for about 30 seconds. Haha ha must be the men men, dad. Am feeling a little on edge because a light appearing out of nowhere and hovering in front of the car is freaky as fuck. Dad doesn't give a fuck. He starts making verbal challenges to the light. He challenges it to try and lead him off the road. Light disappears. It appears again about 15 minutes later and hovers in front of the car again. Dad stops the car and gets out. The light starts moving off the road and stops about 10 meters off the road and hovers. Dad starts challenging the light again. Is that the best you've got? Picks up a rock and throws it at the light. All the while I'm sitting in the car not knowing whether to shit myself with fear or piss myself laughing at my dad fighting with the light. After a few seconds the light disappears. At this point we're pretty hungry so we stay there for about half an hour or so and make something to eat. Every five minutes dad starts yelling out for the light. Bring it on. I'm waiting. The light never comes back the whole time back. TL, doctor my dad had a fight with a paranormal light myth and won. 40 minutes and go. Start falling asleep. Try to sleep paralysis. Thinking of this girl I've been crushing on. Decide the paralysis is T working. Go to sleep normally. Suddenly while my eyes are closed I feel like everything is illuminated. My exposed skin feels extremely warm. No idea what the fuck is going on. Something happens. Loud as fuck noise. Sounds like someone sucking eye really loud. Wake up. It's exactly 1.30. Guys I'm fucking scared right now. I'm not sleeping till daylight. Reposting a somewhat scary story I posted in a thread like this one or two months back. Backpacking in a California near place or a canyon, for those who know Southern California. Then climbing up rock faces, traveling alongside the riverbed. Go through a narrow portion of canyon, which ends ahead of us at a cliff. Find ourselves in a cove-like area. As I walk forward, find a meaty skull. Think what the fuck and begin looking around. Finding bits of pieces, unsure of what animal it was. Then we find a leg. Just a leg. It was a deer. Walk 20 feet forward and see a carcass rip into pieces, including a spine in two pieces. Realize where we are and nope dot jpg the fuck out of there. Be 10 or some shit like that, still a child. Dad took me to look at the tree removal up in a hills in northern CA, give the guy an estimate on the price and stuff. Water off because they're taking a long time at it, and I like exploring. Go into the tree line, deep green grass and wildflowers everywhere, really nice. Here running water, go down into narrow ravine full of spring-fed creek. Grass obscures the edge, carefully edge down towards it and look over the edge. Tilde for a deep pool with big yellowish white tangle in the bottom. My brain processes they are a skeleton. Nope hard. The undercut bank gives away and I fall, slide into the water. Feel the bones against my legs and sides, thrash like a motherfucker. Didn't scream, I guess I was too scared, shocked to. Get out up the other side of the creek onto a little gravel bar. Look back into the water. Dead deer, parts of the hide, tendons still clinging to the bones. Get up the courage to step back in the water to get back across, I was sure the thing was going to jump up and drag me back in. Sprint back up over the hill. Dad's mad I ran off and got wet. I did a lot of stupid shit like that when I was little. It's a funny story thinking back now, but it was serious fucking business to my younger self when it happened. Not really a nope.jpg moment like the unexplainable stories in here, but it was quite the experience then. This was about, oh hell, about 13 years ago now. Go hunting elk with uncle and dad in the Colorado wilderness, 15 miles in, 15 miles back, no vehicles because wilderness. Uneventful week of waiting for something to show up that's shootable. Have a few almost shots but don't take them because they weren't 100% clean. 
Last day, Dad bags a cow, 20 yard shot clean through the heart, drops instantly. It's twilight, fully dark by the time we finish field dressing it. End up deciding to split up into groups to haul the meat out. Dad and Uncle each take a quarter, leave me behind to finish cleaning up the carcass and guard it from scavengers. I take about an hour to finish cleaning the area, lob the entrails a long way away from the carcass itself, then decide to build a small fire because it's damn cold already. Think I hear something unusual against the natural background noise every now and then, think nothing of it at time. Few minutes later, I notice a ring of shining eyes around me, helpfully illuminated by the fire I just built. Nope. I'm carrying a revolver and my hunting rifle, nowhere near enough ammo to kill every set of eyes around me if they don't get scared off. Work myself into a frenzied panic because 14. Throw a bunch of wood on the fire and pull the revolver out, start pacing around yelling and shouting, raving and swearing at the top of my lungs. Eyes start moving around, like they're unsure of what to do. I'm almost shaking so hard I can't even aim straight, but it's well past midnight by this point and I'm in fight or flight mode. Level the revolver at the largest set of eyes that hasn't really moved around much, steady my aim, and pull the trigger. Blam, cone of flame, etc., I see probably 30-50 bodies in the flash, more than I'd counted pairs of eyes from. Hear a bunch of high-pitched snarling, weird yelping and then dead silence, nothing, no wind, no insects, no sound at all. Keep myself worked up on a hair trigger until the fire starts to die down, at which point I gather all nearby fuel. A few pairs of eyes occasionally pop up and then blink out moments later, but never in as large of a number or for as long as the first time. Dad and Uncle get back a couple of hours later, hurrying after they heard the shot. I recount the events of the evening, and we go look for the thing I shot. First hob thing, no tracks anywhere, the ground was completely undisturbed as far around as we bothered to check. Second odd thing, an enormous blood stain about 50 yards away from the fire, I'm talking huge like another elk just liquefied on the spot, tons of blood. No other parts, no fur, no hair no tissue, nothing but blood, and no, it wasn't the pile of elk guts I'd tossed away earlier. No sign of a struggle, nothing disturbed, just, nothing else out of the ordinary. They'd written me off as a panicked kid until we found the fuck huge blood stain. We decide not to split up again and each take a massive load, tilde 90 pounds, of meat and leave the rest to the wild. Hike out by starlight, it's about 3 a.m. now. The entire way back. Keep hearing occasional heavy breathing around us and feel like we're being watched, but every time we pop the flashlights on there's nothing to be seen or heard. Keep a brutal pace back to the nearest trail and then down to where we had our vehicles parked. Hear later that two campers went missing in that area a month or so later. We never end up going back. Sorry if it was a bit long and boring, but that's the most noteworthy event I've experienced personally. Not exactly in a woods, but kinda scary. Spending the summer with my aunt and uncle in Co when I was 13. They own an assload of land in the western slopes. Brought my boxer Dash with me, they own a German shepherd named Gunner. Dash was a hyperactive idiot who would chase anything. My uncle swears that Gunner once chased off a cougar, Gunner never took shit from anyone and only tolerated Dash. One night with no warning both dogs jump up and run down the into the basement as far away from the doors and windows as they can get and cower under my uncle's pool table. Both dogs are shaking uncontrollably. My uncle locked all the doors, he made me close and lock all the second story windows. Kept his rifle loaded and next to him for the rest of the night. I have never seen dogs so afraid. Dash literally pissed himself with fear. One time when I was younger. I'm out shooting shit, old school pellet gun, in my family's backwoods like a normal kid growing up in rural WI. Being very content with being 11 or 12 in a very lively woods with my handy rifle. I'm all over these chipmunks. They had no chance. 
After I'd shoot them I'd leave them out on a stump next to the field and owls would come and get them. So as I'm delivering the soon to be owl pellets to the stump shit gets quiet. Dead quiet. I only realize this after I get the stage 1 nope feeling, standing hairs. When I set down the sacrifices to the owl gods I up to the stage 2 nope and spot some thin rubbings that go 5 feet up a tree. That's strange. I feel as if I'm being watched. Start to nope back to the house. Quickly hits stage 4 nope as fight or flight kicks in and I run the last 50 meters to my backyard and turn around. Still nothing in sight. That night I retired soon after I finished learning to call with my dad, as is tradition. As I'm sleeping my mom bursts into my room. I'm thinking, WTF mom, sees talking on the phone and saying something about a family friend coming over soon. So I get up and walk to the living room as my dad starts loading his 3006. Time check. Not past midnight. Hey dad, where you going? I heard, family friend, is coming over. Son your sister just saw a mountain lion through her window. He and I are going to kill it before someone gets hurt. Shit. Everything clicks. At that very moment we hear the scream of a dying woman. Everyone is kinda freaked. My dad just says, yep, that's a cougar. Riding dirt bikes with cousin in Florida backwoods. Small track we found a few days earlier with some ramps, etc. in the forest. Route from the nearest road goes by an old abandoned building that we explored the first time we went by, nothing inside. Spend half a day buzzing around on the track having fun. Start heading back. Abandoned building is not there. Trees and brush are covering the place the building should have been. There's only one way down to the track from the road, so there's no way we took the wrong way out. Not a fucking thing there. Look around for a few minutes, get spooked, nope the fuck out of dodge. Go back the next day because dirt bikes are fun. Building is there again. Do a 180 and GTFO. Haven't been back. It wasn't a trailer or anything either. It was an old wooden cabin that had a frame of loge driven into the ground. It's not like someone could pull up and hitch the thing to a truck and drive away with it. Posted this one in a slash k slash reapy thread ages ago. Story is from an ex-military guy I know from the pub. Pallet flying up in the Northern Territory. Radio into the airstrip he knows the couple that run it. Says he'll be there in 4 hours will radio when he's near the airstrip. Gets close to airstrip radios the couple in. No reply. Circles and tries again still no reply. Goes to airstrip in the next town over. Tells the lads working there the couple never picked up their radio. They call the police. Police come around to them they all travel to the airstrip the cup alone. Get there about 2 or 3 a.m. The lights in the house are off but the spotlights are on somewhere shining off into the hill. They walk around the side of the house where the dogs are kept. Two things they notice right away. The dogs are dead but there was no sign of physical harm on them they all had looks of terror on their face it appears they were literally scared to death. Second thing was the side of the house was riddled with bullet holes but they were fired from the inside out. They go into the house to find the couple dead on the ground with the man's R15 in his hand. They had a look of fear and shock on their faces same as the dogs, and they were said to have died the same way as the dogs. Police radio it in. At dawn most the other police and paramedics get there and so do some lads from the Air Force. They saw them talking to the police then came over to the locals and told them to fuck off out of here and don't tell anyone what they saw or may have heard. The guy who told the lad from the pub I go to was in the USAF and was involved with Project Blue Book and other UFO related business, he told him strange lights and other strange events had went down in the area the night of the incident. I have a creepy story that happened to me many years ago when I was about 14. Dad says he's going to the store and asks if I want go. No, I'm playing Goldeneye. My sister goes too so I am at home alone. An hour passes and I hear the back door in the garage open and close very loudly. Ignore it and keep playing. Hear it again. WTF somebody is breaking into the house. Grab my bat and go into the kitchen and put my ear against the door to listen into the garage. 
I can hear shuffling around and what sounds like cardboard being dragged around the floor. I freak out. Put all my weight on the door and lock it. Just as I lock it, something pushes on the door very forcefully. Fuck this. Run out to the front yard and contemplate calling the police. Think to myself, I'm a man I got this. Sneak around the side of the house and into backyard. Call my dogs but they will not leave their dog houses, which scares me even more. Psych myself up and barge into the garage yelling and swinging the bat. Nobody is in there. Nope the fuck out of there and sit in the front yard till I see my dad gets home. That wasn't the first time something like that happened there. That house was seriously fucked up. A lot of unexplainable, creepy things happened to us while we lived there. I have a story from when I was in basic training. Not paranormal hut at the time I was shitting myself. 2003 FT. Jackson, South Carolina. I was 18 just out HS. Joined the army so I'm badass mentality. Battle buddy was 25 years old skinny Mormon dude from Utah. Final FDX second night we get sent on a recon mission for a down helicopter. Pitch black middle of the forest. My battle buddy and I navigate to the given cords. Radio and we found it and hold a perimeter while waiting for medics slash drill sergeant to arrive. Laying in the prone position. One hour goes by. WTF is taking so long? Two hours go by we radio back to base and get no response. I love the woods and all but I was getting spooked at this point. About 2.5 hours and we hear something in the forest moving around. Yell our challenge thinking it's our relief. Get no reply, yell again and still nothing. The sound starts getting closer and closer. Thinking Sasquatch is hunting us or I'll look up and see Jason and his mask standing over me. Want to nope back to our base. Battle buddy stays calm says no we stay and wait. WTF he had balls of steel now. All of a sudden something goes right over our heads and we hear branches break and moving. Battle agrees we should go. Hear the craziest noise ever come from 5 feet to our 5 o'clock. Sounded like a woman's screaming bloody murder mixed with a horse. No. We run back to our FDX site thinking we were gonna die the whole time. It turns out while we were gone Opus 4 attacked and then our DS forgot we were out there. I was so glad to be back near people. That nut haunted me for years, until a few years back I heard that sound again. It was an eastern screech owl. I agree. I was seriously scared shitless. But now I look back and laugh at myself. None of my stories are too spooky I guess. They were at the time when they were happening. I'm also a shit storyteller lol. Here's a quick story before I go to bed. 2005, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I was 20 years old. I was in the 82 Airborne Division. I had a random Wednesday off because I had duty the night prior. Decide to go fishing out on some ponds on base. Grab a few beers from my roommate and go. Hit a few ponds and nothing is biting. Four beers deep at this point I go to THW next pond. Sitting there fishing. I feel like I'm being watched. Look around but no one is around. Finish beer 4 and open beer 5. The water starts bubbling and forming little waves. Confused as hell now. Combined with the feeling like I was being watched I decide to call it quits. Right as I stand up I see something fries out of the water. Then another right next to it. Two dudes in scuba gear pop out. Both have beards AMD look scary as shit. Ask what I'm doing, my name, rank, company, COS name and 20 other questions. Still thinking WTF is going on. Get told to leave and never come to that area again. Go back to my barracks and then I realize what happened. The guys were most likely Delta Force and I got a little too close to their compound. I saw those two guys the following week quite a few times. Maybe they were following me, or maybe it was coincidence. That's awesome, it is a really interesting nugget of knowledge about the movie. 
I was even told she made a cameo in the movie as one of the students in the lecture, she was the finely dressed older woman in the stadium. Anyway, so, one more weird thing that happened in Japan before I move on to later years. We lived in Negishima for a bit, after my older brother and I were born. Of course, this means a lot of time has passed between the suicide ghost thing, approximate five years, and my mom's more or less comfortable with her life. In this house, everyone slept in the same room, me, seeing as I'm only a few months old, and my then five-year-old brother because he felt lonely on his own. Anyway, one night, she's awoken by the sensation of someone else being in the room. Of course, other than the typical family members. She says she was too scared to open her eyes or even move, she just laid there and screamed in her head for the thing to go away and leave her family alone. After several minutes, or hours, who knows, she finally feels this presence slip away, and she relaxes herself and goes to sleep. Now, this doesn't seem at all strange if it were not for the morning after. When my mom woke up, she noticed one side of her face was freezing cold. She shot up in bed and looked at her pillow, there, on the pillow, was a fistful of a grey, gelatinous substance. My mother described it as brain-like. Horrified, she screamed for my dad to get up and made him inspect the material, of course, my dad sees it and wonders what the hell it is. When my mom realizes that no one has any clue that the fuck this squishy, great thing is, she promptly scooped it up with toilet paper and flushed it down the toilet. Though, she does regret doing that, her reasoning that she should have taken it down to the university and had it thoroughly checked out. We moved from Japan shortly after, when I was barely a year old. We spent some time in Cali, of which I can barely remember, then Louisiana my dad's home state, but then by the time I was four we had moved to Hawaii, on the island of Oahu to be specific. At first we lived on base housing but my dad soon retired from active duty and thus we were upended and forced to find new jobs and a new house. We ended up in one of those, I think the word for it is a single story duplex that shared a common wall. We lived in the back apartment, where we had our own patio and a huge garden in back that our landlords, who lived in the front portion with a garage and patio, wife took care of. I never knew this little tidbit of information until after I moved out, but apparently her mother used to live in the section we lived in and had died there a very old and very happy woman. It was her garden and she had loved and taken care of it like a child, thus we were always told to treat the garden with respect which my brother and I did without question. In this house, it was mostly very quiet. There were little things here and there that I can remember, footsteps in the grass in the evenings, our dog barking for hours at end at something nobody could see in the backyard, a shadow of a little girl standing in the doorway to me and my brother's room, simply peeking in curiously. The only malicious and strange thing was the room my brother and I shared was constantly, and I mean constantly, cold. It felt like there was an AC on full blast in that room, but our house did not have an AC unit at all. As well, if my mom and I spent too much time in the room, we would get headaches that wouldn't leave until we left the house. But just because the house was odd didn't mean it didn't spook the hell out of other people. Cue my brother's friend Jay. As I knew Jay, he was a very open, friendly, fast-talking dude who loved to just be happy. I liked him a lot, where my brother was smart-assed or introverted, Jay was outgoing and always willing to actually talk to me. A lot of the kids on my block were around my brother's age instead of mine, so I always tried to hang around him and his gang which wasn't cool with him at all because a, I was the baby and couldn't keep up with the big boys and b, it's not cool to let your sister tag along, it was always a boy's thing. But Jay never let any of those factors bother him and was always happy to hang out with me when the other guys wouldn't, so I knew him as a brother from another mother. This is so you guys get a feel for Jay's personality, before I launch into the story. So, obviously, my brother had a lot of friends and we constantly had people over. This made my mom happy because she had always dreamed of having a lot of kids and so she sort of mothered and adopted each and every one of our friends. 
Our house sort of became the house everyone wanted to stay over at, so there was always someone sleeping over, well into our high school years. This story takes place while my brother and his friends were about 16 to 17. My brother had his first serious girlfriend and was constantly hanging out with her and, when apart, calling her on the phone. Jay was staying the night. My bro was in the kitchen, which is mostly fenced in by walls and a counter, talking to his GF on the phone while Jay was merely zoning out to music on the living room floor. All of a sudden, it gets cold. Not the whole room either, but just a certain spot, to his side, over an arm. Weirded out, he glances that way to see nothing. Then this spot starts moving. Up his arm, over his neck, up to his mouth, and he describes it as the strangest sensation. Like kissing a pair of frozen lips that aren't there. It's then he realizes shit ain't right and sits up, touches his lips, and looks around for whatever just kissed him. He finds nothing out of place, aside for a cold spot now a bit further from him, close to where our couch was. He calls for my brother to come and check it out, as confirmation he's not imagining this cold thing. My bro comes around, still on the phone, and when he hovers his hand in that particular area, he seems pretty surprised to find it's remarkably cold in that one area. Now, here's where it gets really weird. At this point, Jay says my brother's face blanked out. His eyes glazed over, and he went limp so suddenly that he dropped the phone, and John distinctly remembers hearing his GF asking, Hello? Hello? Is anyone there? Hello? What's happening over there? Of course, my brother fell back onto the couch, and his lips were moving, but nothing really came out. Jay tries to snap my bro out of it, so he gets close and starts to shake him, that's when he can finally hear what my brother is saying. In a feminine voice that was definitely not my brother's, he said, I'm sorry I did that, you just reminded me of someone I loved. Over and over. When he gives him a particularly hard shake, my brother snaps out of it and seems relatively confused as to why he's on the couch and the phone is on the floor, why Jay looks so freaked out, and why the cold spot was no longer there. Anyway, my brother shrugged the whole thing off, laughed at Jay and called him a jockster, and quickly went back to talking with his GF with apologies and sweet nothings. Jay was shaken, he never spent the night at our house after that. He said he felt like he was constantly being followed and watched in our house, and tried to make a point of not staying too long. This happened back when I was around 11 to 12 years old, while we were still living in Holy Circle, the duplex. Before I launch into the story, I suggest looking up the place on Google Maps, as I haven't too much of a clue as to how to describe the neighborhood. I want to say cul-de-sac, but I know that's not really the term for it. Anyway, we lived in 1432, which was on one of the corners of Huli Circle, and my brother's friend's house was located near the corner of Polykaiko ST, so though the full of our house wasn't visible from either driveway or yard, at least the corner and the roof was, if memory serves right. Okay, but now for the story. One night, I remember waking to what sounded like a helicopter overhead. What was strange about this was, not only was it incredibly late at night, but the longer I lay there in bed, the sound did not recede. I recall looking out towards the window and seeing nothing but a bright light out there and, of course, I began to think rationally. I knew there was a ditch in the backyard that ran up into the mountains, where a jail, Hailwa, was located. Needless to say, I thought someone escaped and was using the ditch to hide out, I shat Brixes. Of course, this sound didn't go away for a while, I fell back asleep before it went away, and I remember thinking it was odd, if they were searching, shouldn't it move around? And no one else in the house had come to check on anyone else, was I the only one hearing it? And damn it, the pressure in my ears hurt like a bitch. Of course, I brushed it off as nothing for the past few days. But one day, me and my mother were chatting and the subject of weird things came up, and I eventually asked her about the noise. 
My mother looked surprised, then scared, and excitedly told me that she heard it too and thought something was going on outside. She never bothered to even open her eyes like I had. She also mentioned that my brother had asked her about it too. I felt relieved, so I wasn't the only one to hear this noise. The only one exempt was my father, which wasn't unusual. But then she went on to say that my brother's friend had heard it too. In fact, he claimed to have seen it as well. I asked if he told her what he saw, and here's what he said, late that night, his dog was barking up a storm and his dad told him to go shut the dog up. So, at that ungodly hour, he got up to see what was upsetting the dog when he noticed a bunch of bright lights. When he looked up into the sky, he said it looked like a large round disc with flashing lights on the bottom, hovering over our house. He was scared shitless, but before he could gather his wits again, the thing had zoomed off. Now, I don't know if I trust what this friend said. I didn't know him nearly as well as the rest of my bro's friends, and what I did know of him, he was the type to want to appear tough and badass, so for all I know, he was talking shit. The only thing I do know is that three out of the four people in the house did hear the same thing and felt the pressure in their ears, but it could have been a low-flying helicopter. I don't even have a clue why you didn't share this right away on your own, this is top tier stuff. I really don't know what to think of this. My thoughts scream alienin uyums, but I actually never really got a hang for all this alien stuff like, apparently, most of slash x slash. Might have been a helicopter, but why didn't it move? Did you ever hear something about a convict escaping around that time? Google Maps also says there's some mental health institution, maybe might have been someone from there, too. Also, even if this sounds stupid, but if your friend didn't tell bullshit, even though it really sounds like a cliche, Maybe instead of an UFO or whatever it was some sort of experimental government stuff. Actually anything I can think of seems to be bullshit at some point. I don't even really know what to say to this. Feels like my brain's about to explode. Laughing face, would love to hear other opinions, other than bullshit, on this. I don't even know if there's still anyone lurking in here, but I love your stories. Any chance you got more to tell? This is turning into my favorite thread ever back from work. Haha, <laughs> my and my part-time job. Anyway, I have much more, in fact, I'm getting to the worst house I have ever lived in. This house ruined me so to speak, it is because of this house I developed some weird habits, the most prominent being I cannot be in a bathroom by myself. If I am to shower or do anything, I have to take at least a pet with me. So, we stayed in that duplex until my brother graduated from high school and joined the Air Force, haha, <laughs> my mom can't pronounce it and calls it the Air Horse. This would be just around the age I started high school and my parents were getting fed up with our landlord, he was top tier creeper, really weird creeper, made me feel really bad for his wife, so they were looking into moving way before this. They finally found a place they were satisfied with in an apartment building called Pearl 1 on 98 to 500 Koaka Loop. The apartment that was open was 22A, the apartment on the right side facing Waikiki, all the way at the end of the left hall on the 22nd floor. I can't honestly say I was creeped out by the place when I laid eyes on it. I was too distracted with the WO 22nd floor Ayesham and OMG they have a kitty here. I just thought of everything as another place to live, but that could be I really don't realize something creepy is upon me until well after the creepiness has settled. Anyway, so for the first few months, everything was pretty honky-dory, everything smooth sailing. Then the nightmares started. These were weird nightmares. Really weird nightmares. I remember once dreaming of two prepubescent boys playing in a junkyard when suddenly one of them goes berserk and begins stabbing the other with a rusted screwdriver. I can remember their faces and everything. Sometimes, I'd dream that I had no choice but to kill myself. Sometimes I'd dream about hurting others, either as myself or someone else. A nightmare I used to have as a kid returned, a volcano would erupt covering everything in lava and killing everyone only I was left alive floating on my indestructible bed. As I sob over dead family and friends, molten hot skeletons being clawing over the sides, melted eyes glowing, 
as they try to drag me over. I slept beneath my bed in retaliation, figuring if they couldn't get me if I was already in their space. I began to notice my nightmares intensified if my sliding door closet was opened. I never knew why, but I made the connections because whenever I'd wake from these nightmares, I would be facing this open closet full of Japanese futons and extra blankets. I tried to keep that door closed as often as possible. Then I had the nightmare that made me put chairs in front of my closet, to prevent them ever again. It was a weekend because I was home alone and my parents had gone out, so I kept my room door open to listen for them and took a nap on my futon. My futon was pressed against the wall beside the closet but I figured my closet door was nice and tightly shut and it being a sliding door, I should be good and fell asleep. I dreamed I had woken up and went to the closet, opened it, crawled on top of all the blankets and bedding in there, and sat with my knees up in the darkness. I don't know how long I stayed there but it felt like forever before I suddenly became aware of a presence beside me. I looked from the corner of my eye to notice a little boy, perhaps 8 to 10, sitting beside me. He appeared nude, scrawny, pale little fucker with darkish hair. He had his knees up as well and his head buried in them, arms wrapped around to cover most of his face. I was curious, what was this kid doing in my closet? Is he sad and hiding from something? That was the sense I got, despair and wanting to escape from this poor little figure. So we sat, side by side, silently until he finally stirred and looked up and for some reason, the sight of his eyes scared me beyond all reason. They were gold and his pupils were, for lack of better word, hourglass shaped. They were blank, like a goat's, and if it weren't for the indent in the middle I'd say they were goat's eyes. I could not get out of the closet fast enough and I felt myself stirring awake. I could twitch my fingers and arms and I was starting to open my eyes when I felt someone breath into my ear then laugh huskily. It was a deep male's laugh. Throaty and breathy. I know I felt the breath. I jolted up wide awake after that. I was scared out of my wits. In hindsight, this could have been sleep paralysis but there was one thing I can't explain. My closet door was open when I woke up and I was still alone. After this, it's a whole jumbled mess of specific memories that I don't remember what chronological order they go in anymore. So, I'll just give them titles and just list in which order you would like to hear them. I actually like recounting them, I love paranormal, so sharing these is kind of a passion, and I like to hear others' inputs on them. The only thing that would really put me off is if someone said we should go back to that apartment in which case unless it were only to ghost hunt, I would fucking refuse. Anyway, so here they are, computer scare, AC says hi, bathroom, bathroom hallway, friends ghost, line of people, elevator, torso in the hall, the jumping man, the yellow eyed man, and woman on a wall. Bathroom, since you mentioned it earlier. So, the layout of the apartment went like this, you stepped through the door into the foyer and immediately to your right was the kitchen and to your left is a shoe closet. There was a half counter separating the living room slash dining room and to the left of the living room past the shoe closet was a T-shaped hall. The shorter hall at the front led to the two bedrooms one at each end and the long hall that split this short hall went past a full length mirror, washer and dryer, two sinks and ended in the bathroom. This hallway consistently creeped me out. Noises, movement out of the corner of the eye, and a mounting sense of dread every time one stood in the hallway was already starting to manifest along with a lot of other instances, such as the bathroom hallway instance. Anyway, so in order to avoid being scared the poop out of, I slowly start to become a night owl. This means sleeping all day and staying up all night. Well one night, I decide to shower for whatever reason at a time between midnight and 1 am, when everyone else in the household is asleep. I start doing my usual routine, starting with washing my hair when I start to hear a faint noise that wasn't water hitting porcelain. It takes a moment to register just what I was hearing, a woman screaming. Absolute bloody murder, anger, and horror and anguish obvious in her voice but it was so 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 faint I couldn't possibly fathom where it was coming from at first. 
I turn to look out the tiny window in the corner of the shower, the only form of ventilation in our bathroom and think it can't possibly be coming from there, after all, I live on the 22nd floor. So I am rinsing my hair of shampoo, dwelling on this screaming which is still going on when I finally pinpoint it. It's coming from the drain. Between my feet. Okay, I think. It's probably a neighbor, watching TV, and the noise is just traveling through the pipes. No biggie. I'm fairly convinced of this now, and am on the train of thought wondering who the hell is watching TV while in their bathroom and wasn't doing such a thing fucking dangerous. And as I am thinking along those lines, as if to retaliate my nonchalant brushing off, the screaming starts to get incrementally louder. Of course, I figure some fucker is just slowly turning up their TV. It takes seconds to register that the screaming is turning to faint screaming and gargling. It's not a TV. It's literally in the pipes. And it's coming closer, starting to echo as it comes up the drain. Then this thought hits me, what will be here when it finally reaches the end of the drain? Fear suddenly washes over me. The sort of fear that lead me to shut the shower off, soap still half in my hair and fall out of the shower in a panicked scramble as the screaming continues. I don't bother with clothes or even a towel, I leave all the lights on for my parents to scold me about in the morning because I ran through the hallway and into my room and locked the door. After that, I never showered unless someone was home. Soon after this, the woman on the wall incident happened. And from then on, that little window in the corner of the shower? I could feel someone staring in through it, constantly watching me. Every now and then, if I glanced up at it in the corner of my eye, I could see the swish of long black hair disappearing out of sight. As for the torso in the hall, this one is pretty weird and I really wouldn't put it past that it was my overactive imagination when I was already spooked by this apartment as a whole. In any case, I'll tell you how it went. As I said, I lived on the 22nd floor. The elevators were smack dab in the middle of a long hallway. My apartment was on the hallway to the right. There was a light bend in the hallway that just kind of followed the curve of the apartment closest to the elevator, so a slight S-shape before it was all straight and full of rows of apartment doors. Everything was closed in, BTW. So I am coming home late from school. It's about 4 p.m. and the whole place is just silent as the grave. It wasn't unusual, considering the walls and doors were always pretty thick, so it was hard to hear the neighbors unless they were doing their damnedest to slam and throw things around, which has happened. I step off the elevator, go around the S-curve and am halfway to my apartment when a familiar tingling feeling comes over me. It's the same sense of dread I get going into the bathroom, passing by the hallways, or even looking out my window on occasion. I know something is behind me and I'm an idiot trying to convince myself there isn't anything there, so I look. And that's when I see it. I have a really hard time describing it, because it was so abnormal and I really only managed to catch a quick glimpse of it. It was a very desiccated, like leathery charred skin stretched over nothing but bones. It had no legs, not even stumps, but it did have abnormally long, bony arms with which it dragged itself. I think it had wispy remnants of hair. It almost looked like a mummy left too long in the sand and then set on fire. And it was crawling around the bend, in my direction. There may have been noise, I don't know, because all I could really hear was the jingling of my keys and the many keychains I had on my backpack as I booked it the rest of the way to my apartment door. I could barely put the key in the lock because I was so scared my hands were shaking and I even turned the key the wrong way in desperation. I made it into my house and slammed the door, locking every lock and even locked myself in my room. A few days after that, when the fear had time to lose its edge and the incident seemed more like a bad dream or a hallucination I could dismiss, I remember taking a break from mucking about on the computer in the evening and just looked out across my room. If I were a smoker, I probably would have done that, but for me I just mentally shut down a moment to relax. When I finally focused, I realized I was staring blankly into my TV, which was turned off at the time and I finally noticed I was really watching the reflection of my room in the screen. 
and saw someone who shouldn't be there. I saw a young man, with pale blonde closely cropped hair a la the military crew cut, nervously pacing back and forth in a room much bare than mine, puffing away at a cigarette. He seemed to have freckles and a pencil-thin mustache. I don't know why I remember very well how this young guy looked, but I do. And I remember he looked very, very, very antsy. In the blink of an eye, the scene was gone and I was looking at my room again. Now, the only reason I mentioned the soldier was because I did manage to man up to my mom about six months before we moved out of that apartment for good. I told her everything I am telling you guys now. I spilled my guts. When I told her about this, she did bring up something interesting I figured you guys might want to dwell on. The apartments I lived in were crawling with military folk. Hell, Pearl Harbor was in view from one the stairwells. The war in the Middle East was starting. She thinks I may very well have seen the aftermath of some poor sod who lived in the apartment, and then caught him again in the reflection of my TV before he died. Elevator sounds cool. I've always been terrified of them for some reason. Might as well add more fuel to the fire, lel. Then prepare your anus. Because this scared a lot of my friends at the time too. The apartment only had two elevators and I only ever seemed to be able to catch one of them, which was the elevator on the farthest right, which incidentally was the elevator closest to the hallway my apartment was down. Good for cutting time, bad for other reasons. This elevator, without fail, constantly stopped on the 19th floor. I could be the only person in the elevator, it would stop and open on the 19th floor. I could be going up or down, stop on the 19th floor. No one would be seen on the floor either, down the halls or anything. I checked, because I was pretty sure someone was fucking with me. No door slammed in a hurry, no noise, just the usual silence. And even when I had an elevator full of people, whether I knew them or not, stop on the 19th floor. One day, I am taking the elevator up after getting home from school. And, lo and behold, it stops on the 19th floor. Doors open. No one there. I sit around, listening to my CD player, waiting for the doors to close and carry on my merry way. The doors remain open, as though someone were holding the door open. I grow bored. I peek out, no one. Finally pull myself back in, the door slowly shut, I watch the numbers rise up to 22. Ding. I heft my backpack higher up my shoulders, walk out, around the S-curve. I am on the 19th floor. It stares at me, taunting and confusing all in its own right, as the numbers painted on the wall and door say 19. I am fucking tripping. How did? But the elevator rose, the numbers changed. Thinking I daydreamed it all, I slowly shuffled back to the elevator, pressing the button to go up. The elevator crawled down from the 22nd floor, opened and ready and empty. I am shaken and I press 22, just wanting to go home. I feel the familiar lift as it crawls up, see the numbers slowly rise to 22. I'm going home, fuck this elevator, I just want to go home and sleep. IT stops on 22. And it stays there. The doors don't open, but the numbers become unlit as though it were in disuse. I try to push the door open placebo button, but nothing is happening. Then the whole metal death trap shutters, eaves, and I feel like I am starting to fall. I think, for the briefest of moments, oh shit. I am going to die in a freak elevator accident. I swear, it feels like it drops five floors. Five floors of free fall. I barely have time to catch myself in a corner when it feels like sudden brakes kick into gear and catches the cables, causing the whole car to shudder again, but there is no screeching of metal. Just the walls shaking and me falling into a corner, limbs spread out to prevent injury. And, as though nothing happened, the elevator begins its slow crawl up again, up back to 22. Lights are back on and cheery as ever, 22. Shaken, when the door opens I rush out. The doors close behind me and, once again, 
19th floor. Needless to say, I climbed the staircase for the last three floors and for about a week afterward. If you're still here mate, could you post it the computer scare please? You got it. I was sitting at my computer, minding my own business, I know I wasn't doing anything important, so that probably means I was bored and chilling to music. I know I was wide awake, since I recall talking to a bunch of friends in time zones that were maybe, three, four hours ahead of me but it was late enough that everyone else in the house was asleep. So, maybe midnight. The computer is set up right next to the door of my room, which I've always kept shut tight at night out of fear of the hallway, the one connected to the bathroom, and in this instance only strengthened this fear. I remember that the door I was next to started to rattle, gradually growing stronger by the moment, passed it off as the wind blowing in from maybe the bathroom. It wasn't too unusual, particularly since we lived way up on the 22nd floor of the apartment. But then it started to sound a little less like the usual wind tugging on the door and more like someone was pounding at it, so I turned to look at it, as though that would do anything to it, only to notice spindly white fingers reaching through the cracks in the door jam, looking like they were trying to tug the shit open. After staring at this horror for what was probably a few seconds, they retreated and the noise stopped. Needless to say, I froze before rushing to turn every light in my room on while walling up that door. I refused to sleep for a day or two after that, and almost didn't want to step out of the room at daybreak. Catching the eye of something evil is a horrifying event. My mother still believes the ghost of the woman from the suicide house is following her and occasionally does blessing throughout her house, if you ask me, any sort of faith seems to drive evil spirits back. It seems to me as long as you believe in something good, darkness is repelled at least for a time. If talking with your vicar makes you feel safe and confident, I totally agree with you. Sure. Um, I'll start with the most comedic one of them all, AC says hot. It is literally exactly what it sounds like. Two friends and I were just hanging around into the wee hours of the morning in my room, each of us doing our own separate things. I believe one was gaming, the other was drawing, and I was chatting to a plethora of friends online while, of course, keeping up with the topics being discussed with my present friends. Anyway, during a lull in the conversation, my air conditioner shut off by itself. This had been going on for a while, actually, so while it spooked one friend I had long grown used to it. The odd thing is, while I know there is a setting on the AC for it to shut off automatically when it senses the room is a certain temperature, I had never set it to the setting and nor did my parents. In fact, when we inspected it, it was on the normal manual setting. Malfunctions. Anyway, it was during this short pause of utter silence that I heard a voice distinctly coming from the AC say hi. Then the damn thing turned itself on. At first, I was wary of saying anything about it but in a few, I decided ah oh, fuck it and opened my mouth and asked. Their responses were, respectively, holy crap, so I didn't imagine that. I heard something, but it could have been anything. I'm not gonna jump to conclusions. Now, friend's ghost. A friend of mine started going out with a Japanese transfer student sometime in our sophomore year. He barely spoke a word of English, if any at all, and was very awkward in general. We all felt bad for the guy but at the same time, his absolute refusal to even try to adjust to the fact his mom remarried and moved and there was diddly squat he could do about it kind of annoyed the heck out of the rest of my little group of friends. We all had our tough problems to overcome in our own ways, so we were and weren't sympathetic to people sat around feeling sorry for themselves when they had a perfectly good opportunity to have a life they wanted. He always talked about how he was in gangs in Japan and tried to give us this badass don't give a fuck attitude while also complaining about how much it sucked here and he wanted to go home. He liked it a lot at my house. I think because he wasn't surrounded by a dad not blood related to him that only wanted to connect with him, a mom who was harried enough adjusting and didn't want to hear him complain and fight her about everything, and a little brother who was perfectly happy adjusting to his new home and culture but he was surrounded by comforts of home, 
my mother spoke with him very often and tried to counsel the best she could, as she could sympathize with his plight and I had more than enough manga to supply a shop. He often settled himself in a nook in my room and devoured comic after comic. If he wasn't at his girlfriend's house, he was at mine trying to sequester away a slice of home. We knew him for about a year. Then one day his GF came to our group, tears in her eyes and broke the news to us. Shun had committed suicide the night before. She said she needed time away from us, she was too upset. We gave her our condolences, then clucked away at the idiocy of suicide. Weeks go by. Then the strangest thing happens. I am at my computer as usual, during daylight, with my room door unusually open, but because someone had to be home for me to leave my door open, thus, open, when I glanced up from the screen and jumped a bit in surprise. Who should I see making a very familiar routine path with his usual slump posture? It's Shun. Dressed in a white robe, just walking from the hallway that lead into the dining room, past the bathroom hall, and into my room, towards the corner of my room where he would settle and read manga. I couldn't believe me eyes. In fact, I think I rubbed them after he had disappeared before he got to that corner out of disbelief. I dismissed the incident. I couldn't have seen him. He died, moved on. Besides, why the fuck would he be here and not with his GF, if he loved her so much? Another few weeks pass and once again, I am at my computer. I'm getting up for one reason or another and this time have to reach to open my door. I open it and once more, there he is. This time, he is standing in the hall between my room and my parents room, bent over and cooing to the pair of lovebirds we kept there. And let me tell you, there has never been a pair of more stressed birds than those two, they were constantly squabbling, fighting, and tearing out their own feathers. We ended up giving them away to someone else who told us within days of her taking them in, they were completely different birds, sweet and caring and always loving to each other. Anyway, there he is, cooing at them, wriggling his fingers like he used to when he passed them by. Gact and David Bowie, I had a really bad sense of humor then, were squawking and upset and Shun straightens himself out and turns to look at me. I'm not even sure if he's looking at me or just replaying something he used to do when he was alive, because he has that faint smirk on his face and as he walks towards my room, he disappears. I never saw him again after that. My mother said she would see him too, doing those same things. Often playing with the birds, sometimes walking through the house either to talk to her or to go into my room. She always said he was dressed in white, just like I saw him. Something interesting she told me, she used to always say if a spirit was dressed in white, they have accepted their death and are ready to move on, or perhaps already moved on but their soul yearns for some past comfort, and comes back to check in on that. If they are dressed in black, grey, or dark colors, they haven't moved on and are stuck in bad emotions, which usually makes them dangerous. She said they still feel like they are alive or are unjustly dead and still wish to be alive, which makes them into more malicious spirits. Do you guys think there's anything to my mom's belief? Line of people. I am pretty sure Katrina had just hit and it was all over the news. I think it was the weekend after and I had finally convinced my mom to just chill with me and watch Ghost Adventures or something equally stupid. So we are sitting on that very futon that I had my nightmare on, facing the TV and just chilling, casually talking about this and that and spirits, this is when she told me about the color of clothing thing, when I happened to glance up and see something that made me jump. It was literally a long line of people, all races, ages, and types. I only caught a brief sight of them, but they were all lined up starting from my closet, the very one I had nightmares of, and going out my door, through our apartment, and straight through our front door. It looked like the line was moving very slow and all of them were waiting patiently for their chance to enter the closet. I must have looked pale or something, because my mom asked me what was wrong. I finally managed to choke out did you see that? She looks me in the eyes and finally says, so you're seeing them too. She said the whole week, 
she's been noticing people she has never seen before dressed in white moving through our apartment, every time heading into my room and disappear through my closet door. I am so thoroughly spooked, because one, I didn't see these people until now too, just how many people were doing this, at all times of the day, while I'm asleep and unaware. And three, what the fuck were they doing in my closet? I never got an answer to those questions. The closest I got was my mom suggested the possibility me, the place we lived in, or the both of us together were creating a portal for spirits to move on, and that was what was going on. Needless to say, I told my mom then and there about everything else that was going on. She performed a blessing, and we moved out six months later. The jumping mad. It started a couple months after we had just moved into Koaka Loop, I can't really pinpoint when. As I mentioned some time earlier in the thread, there was a pool beside the apartments. Next to the pool, was a little park with a swing set and seesaw. My friends and I would often hang out in this little park for shits and giggles, and very often I would visit on my own with my CD player and just swing away, as a form of relaxation. From this park I had a clear view of the road and the apartment across the way. I would usually visit this park towards evening after homework and chores were done, so I could have the whole night to relax if I wanted. It wasn't unusual for me to stay out until 8 or 9 pm, well after dark. A lot of the times, I would just sit out there and sing. Sometimes, I would look at the sky. That's when I noticed him. It was always around 5 or 6 in the evening. I would look to the rooftop of the apartment building across the way and see a silhouette of a man standing there. Slightly stocky, couldn't tell anything else because he was mostly all shadow. He would waver about at the top, then fall over. Before he hit the ground, he'd always disappear. This always happened at the same time, same place. It became part of my routine to watch this man. It spooked me at first but the more it happened, the more accustomed I got to it. I finally got to asking around. The only thing I got was hearsay, but I did hear that a man committed suicide by jumping to his death in that apartment building, but I didn't get anything more than that and I never really wanted to know more than that. The yellow-eyed man. So, now you know what my evening routine was. There was one evening I was doing just that, I reiterate, I am a creature of habit and it is hard for me to break those routines. One evening, I am out on the swings, relaxing, and just having fun. The sun has long set, so it's past 7 in the evening. The jumping man has done his thing and I am alone in the oncoming twilight, trying to see just how high I can get on the swings before I fall. And just as I am on my highest upswing yet, I am forced to ground my feet into the dirt to stop myself because suddenly there is a man in front of me. He is tall, he seems impossibly tall, but that could be because I am pretty short. He's also very pale, I notice, which stands out against his dark colored clothes. He is very blonde too. And his eyes are the most stunning color of gold I think of them like a reptile's eyes, even if they aren't slitted. He's just standing there before the swings, regarding me with a look that says go home little girl and I feel like a rebellious teen and just sit there, staring back at him. I'm wondering if what I am seeing is real. Then I get the familiar tingle. I need to leave. Now. I pick my shit up, shake myself off, and hightail it home so spooked even though, all things considered, whatever just happened was fucking tame. I still don't know who he is, because I never saw him again. What I do know is that as soon as I stepped through the doors my mom hugged me and told me I wasn't allowed outside that night or for a couple of nights afterwards. She had been watching the news and a criminal had just escaped and was using the ditch, the same ditch that ran through my old home in Huli Circle, as a place to hide. The news was advising people who lived within the vicinity to lock their doors and stay inside and me being out and fucking around, had missed the warning. My mom was worried and going to come down to look for me when I had just shown up when I did. And finally, the dreaded woman on the wall. I think this was after my bathroom scare. One evening, preparing to go out to the swings and relax myself, 
I am standing by my window. My windows faced out towards mountains and a highway. It also happened to share a wall with the bathroom, and was facing the very way the bathroom window faced. It was also where the AC unit was located. So I am standing in front of my window, freezing myself in preparation to face the humid Hawaii weather, just feeling happy and ready to go downstairs. I loved the view from this window, I loved looking out into the mountains and down the walls, just admiring the height. It was one of the original reasons I wanted to live there, I love height, I love the sensation of strong winds, I love being able to scope out the world from on high and all the many possibilities of the day. So I am just admiring the view, soon looking down to see the sheer drop of the wall that ended in the walkway to the connected parking garage when I see her. Clear as day and as awkward and confusing as a Picasso painting. It's a woman, pale skinned and very very long thick black hair. She is moving disjointedly up the wall, as though confused how to even use her own limbs. I'm thinking WTF what is wrong with her and it doesn't register to me just yet the fact that this is not a woman on the ground drunkenly flailing around at the wall trying to get a grip. This is a woman actually standing on the wall of the apartment, staggering around trying to get her bearings. When I realize this, a shiver runs down my back. I am getting goosebumps now remembering this and I am super 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 glad my husband is home and all of our windows are covered. Anyway, I realized this was not even remotely normal. As if sensing my thoughts, this woman abruptly stops her movements. Her body turns and what might have been a head snaps up to look at me. I don't remember a face, only a mass of black hair. And as if she'd remembered how to use her limbs, she suddenly spider crawling up the wall at speeds not physically possible, charging towards my window on the 22nd floor. In a panic, without even bothering to turn on any of my lights I simply grab at my curtains and throw them over my window. Everything in my room is dark now. I can't see, but as I figure, she can't see me either. I am panting. I hear nothing. My AC is still whirring away. Maybe it was my imagination. I gather my courage, pick up my metaphorical piss-soaked panties and put them on, and peek out the curtain. Gone. She's go screaming. And before I can really process it, I see that same woman, screaming, falling from the roof. She's hurtling towards the concrete floor, where a couple are located walking in from the parking lot. I see no reaction from the couple, from this screaming woman about to splatter them, when she simply disappears. I slam my curtains shut again and kept them that way since. I would get very upset if someone opened them up, to the point of leaving the room until they were drawn again. Don't have any of my own, I live in Colorado. Be my grandpa. Live out in desert near Mexican border. Nothing ever happens, just sit inside and read. Notice something outside window. Some sort of strange animal. Keep watching. It's a man rolling a barrel. Clearly coming towards house. Go outdoor to meet him. He's obviously been out in desert for a while, delusional. Drenched in sweat. Asks if my truck is mine. Say yes. Asks if he can buy it. Reject. He pulls out a wad of money, thousands of dollars. Sell the car. He drives away. Be near Vegas. Be in a desert. Wandering around with this alcoholic chick and my dog. Dog starts whining. What is it boy? Dog runs over to an old well. Lower self down into well. Fine mint condition Abilene kid BB gun on the skeleton of a kid. Giant mole rat lunges at me out of the shadows. Smoke the critter with my up 7. Such is life in the Mohave. Be me around 20. Visiting family in New Mexico. Decide to visit Roswell. I was obsessed with UFOs and aliens as a kid, the child in me needed to see it. Speeding on the desert road back to Las Cruces at night. Realize how awesome the sky looks, so many stars and clear. Pull over to the side of the road. Lay down on hood of car and just observe the sky for an hour. 
probably one of the most calming and satisfying things I ever did. I noticed shitloads of planes in the sky, some of them just doing weird shit like speeding up and slowing down. And the overwhelming silence, gosh. Used to hang in abandoned casino off Boulder. A Lystra. Had bunch of homeless friends live in it. They went to California. Guess one hobo went crazy from steady diet of meth and roadkill. Crazy guy hung himself in the squat. Went back when friends came home from California. Crazy man had tied pigeons to electrical wire draped them across the ceiling hanging by their necks and had hooked the wires up to a car battery. MFW burn bird smell. MFW electrical wire man hung himself with was still hanging and only cut down. MFW poop was smeared everywhere he had literally pooped on everything and drawn on the walls a desperate cry of all gone dead on the wall. Also drew one of our female friends names all over the wall in doo doo. The smell of cooked roadkill will never leave my brain. Be me. Helping my old man, trucker, with the load of sod that night. Heading out from Vegas around midnight, to Green Valley Sod, near state line, to pick up sod. Stop on Winding Road, near state line. Fuck, got a piss. Pop out, walk a ways behind flatbed. Piss. Feels good man dot jpg. See something out of the corner of my eye. Try to look, but keep wanting to avert my eyes. Keep looking. Feel slightly nauseous. Turn around. Truck is gone. WTF man. Where did doubt, because they know my old man wouldn't have left me on the road like that. Start walking around, in the general direction of where the truck was. Still nauseous, getting worse. Walk about a mile. Really creeped out, nausea getting worse the further I go. Dizzy as fuck, now too. Finally pass out. Wake up, it's nearly dawn. I'm in an ambulance. WTF happened? Apparently, my old man went to check on me, when I didn't come back. Couldn't find me. Called police. MFW they found me, passed out, half a mile ahead of the truck. MFW I have no face. Six years later, after I served in the Navy, some friends of mine were fucking around on Fremont Street There's an old woman, with some hokey looking gypsy wagon, that does tarot readings and shit, so, being a few pints of moose at Rulin, and a WMD each, we decided to have some fun with the woman and get some readings done. She gets to me, and third card in, tells me I had some encounter with the Fae in the past. So now, I'm curious, and ask her to explain. Twenty minutes later, I'm enraptured, asking about how a person would know when they are around and shit. Tells me, I had accidentally stumbled into their world, and apparently decided to push me out and that I was lucky. Creepy as shit, the woman was almost dead on, without me telling her anything about that night. Be only me. Be only me in a barn. Be looking out. See large hairy bip run by. Maximum WTF, think maybe I was seeing things. Next day, broken twigs where I saw it, day after that tapping and grunting on LE little sister's window. Hear something banging rock on a barn. Hear sticks being banged together in a woods. Decide to bang back. Hear sound like a pist of chimp oor. Tactically nope into house. Find footprints, nest, hear ape-like noises, get stick thrown at me over next couple months. Then it's all gone, nothing happens again. Be in a woods camping with friend. Look for a wood to make an evening fire. See a small lizard. Crouch to take a better look. Hear cracking branches in the nearby trees. See running away about two feet tall naked midget with long hair and furry legs. Agile and fast as no human through thick bushes and other shit. Get my bro, start looking for it. He asks if it had hairy legs, didn't tell him that before. Positive. See him chasing that through the railways. Two dense bushes on the other side, midgets too fast. See it running two three hundred yards away. Sitting in a woods. Got M1 Garand. 
have a few clips in a messenger bag-like side pouch. Sitting around campfire. Was hunting that day. Snagged a deer. Waiting around, cooking steak over open fire. Pre-marinated it at home and seasoned it. Hear rustling in bushes to my right. Whip my rifle up and aim at bushes. Young bear, probably just let go by its mother, wants me Gloria steak. Find unseasoned backup steak with no marinate. Toss it over. Light stick on fire in case it comes over. It comes over, wanting more. Get it the fuck away from me with fire. Hear more rustling. See what looks a lot like pick related, sinks. Look it up. Not a fur fuck, just some fiction shit eel parasite that comes from deep space, really creepy. Bear sees thing or whatever it was. Runs in my direction past me. Put rifle down. Get CCW handgun. Grab mini torch. Stand ground. Thing fucks off. I slept inside my truck with my rifle in hands that night. I don't know what it was, what I saw, but all I know it was creepy as fuck, grotesque, and disgustingly evil looking. I saw piercing red eyes and horns, nope the fuck out the next day. Worst fucking thing was, next day, the deer in my truck bed was dragged away. Saw blood in the dirt and a trail, didn't even walk near it. I now think a sinx wants to eat, devour me. I seriously fear for the safety of my well-being and that of my girlfriend. I read on the wiki about the fucker that it devours defenseless, weaker creatures. Thinking it's some other try to few it with the engines the battle happens anyway. Both sides suffer casualties. By twilight they decide it's enough for one day and retreat to their bases. After the events of last night they set up a night watch if a few soldiers. Morning comes and the cook is screaming again. The fate of the Indians was the same as the guard only now the corpses had leave in their chests. The general not being a pussy calls a meeting with the Union General. Asks Union General if he knows what's up. Union Generals is as confused as he is. Confederate General passes it off. Back commences. Blah blah blah. Night times a much larger lookout is set up. Around midnight a shot is heard being fired. General rushes outside to see his men skinned alive but not dead and cloaked figures running off in the woods. General is tactically shitting himself harder than Hiroshima. Bodies are buried and next day battle commences. At night entire camp is pulled into a circle and every inn is on watch. The next morning the Union leader is waiting in the conference tent for a few hours. Growing tired he marches into Confederate camp. Entire camp has been skinned and hung. Good story. Be me. B7. First time shooting. Out camping with my father. That night, we're camped out near this old fire bridge over a creek. Moon's out, this is Oregon so it's bright as a stream lamp. See figures walking across fire bridge. Wake my father up and check his watch. 2.30 a.m., what are they doing out there? Who? We both peek out of the tent, and my father has tactically to revolve out. Last figure in line, there are more than five of them at least, stops and turns around. Hear whispers all around us, notice my father is shaking a bit. He turns around and leaves and the usual wind and coyotes kick back in with the yipping etc. Neither of us slept that night, ended up building a huge fire and staying close to it. Go out the next day. Getting ready to go fishing. Pink water. Pink water? Look upstream and there's a mess of small animals netted together with rusty old barbed wire fencing. We both nope into the ancient ford we took out there. Load all our gear. Get back on the road and drive home. Never go back there or discuss that with anyone. Happened this fall. Hiking in the Appalachian MTNS. Taking a red, most difficult, trail down into a gorge. It's cold, pouring rain, not another person in the area, no cars at the parking area. Every other direction is rough, trail less wilderness. 
About halfway down, we start hearing an unintelligible female voice down the trail, assume we're close to the bottom. Keep going, rounding switchbacks, no end in sight. Trail is mud, no footprints in front of us. We reach the bottom of the gorge where creek runs through. There's a grave next to the campsite. My face is pick related. Friends don't seem as freaked out about it. We stop for lunch before hiking out the other side. Still pouring down rain. I get finished and wander off toward the grave to check it out. Small marker nearby tells how a settler who lived there around the turn of the century left his pregnant wife alone in the cabin while he traveled to the nearest town several days away. When he returned a flash flood had collapsed the cabin and drowned her inside. Nope factor 9 Mr. Crusher. The whole way out my friends don't notice, but I continue to hear distant, indistinct female voices. They wonder why I walk so fast and get so far ahead of them on the way out. Yeah, between the rain, the 16 hard miles of hiking, and the nope, don't think I'll be going back to that place. There is that one pasta of those Finnish kids who went on such an expedition after an encounter with some random creepy critter, wait for a minute and I'll find it. There was also that news article relating to it, I'll see if I find that too. A legit story anyways, the dude who posted it posted the news link and couple of pics of their torn up camp and the lair they found. Just a second. Gotta find it from my other hard drive. Heading for Reno Woods with a bunch of mates somewhere in Northern Europe. We decide to hike to this old abandoned Cold War era military facility. Reach the facility after two days of hiking. Shit is cash, we spend the day exploring and plinking birds with. 22s. By nightfall we set a, a camp in one of the empty warehouses. We go outside, set up a campfire and start making stew. All of a sudden we hear the loudest and weirdest roar I've ever heard. We all shit ourselves, grab our rifles and stare into the darkness. Something is moving about 100 meters out, we hear it rushing through the woods into the facility area. We stand there, silent, listening. Then it stops and suddenly it is dead silent all around us, just the stew slowly boiling on the fire. We look at each other and have a brief chat. We decide to carry on with making the stew. Next morning we wake up and start packing. Everybody is making jokes about how we got so scared of some bear etc. My buddy sees something lurking on top of the biggest facility building. We try to have a look at what it is, but it's too far away some 200 meters maybe. It is just standing there, with two legs, probably staring at us. The thing is huge, maybe over 7 feet tall, I reach for binoculars to have a good look on who is trolling us with ghillie suit. Just as I find the binos my mates start shouting. I look at the creature, or whatever it was, and it seems to be running via the facility wall like a lizard, very very fast. By now it is clear it is not a human, nor any animal I know of. It disappears behind one big bunker structure. We decide to nope the fuck out of there, we're scared shitless even though it is day. As we are hiking back we don't take any breaks before nightfall. As the sun sets down, we make a camp and start preparing supper. Everyone's a little tense and we try to joke around. We decide to do guard duty during the night, my shift is 0103. Birds are singing like crazy, they do that during the night here, and I managed to see a lone rabbit hopping around our campsite, I would have popped that fucker, but I wanted to let my buddies rest. Suddenly the birds stop singing and the rabbit stops, raises its head like it's listening to something. The rabbit nopes out of there very fast like it's running for its life. I feel very uneasy and flick on my flashlight and shine it towards the darkness. I'm hoping to see a glimpse of a fox etc that could have explained the strange behavior of the other animals, but the forest around us seems empty. Just as I'm putting the light out I see something move behind the bushes around 100 meters away, it was something big. I shine the light directly at the bushes and try to get a look off my 10-22s scope. I managed to see something moving there and I believe I saw a pair of yellowish eyes. Then it stands up. 
I don't know to this day what the fuck it was, but it was hairy looking, very dark and had a face. The face of lighter color and there were two yellow eyes, the thing was around 7 feet tall, somewhat human shaped. Although I didn't get a very clear look with my shit ear flashlight I was 100% sure that that thing wasn't a human so I started panicking, raised my gun and lit that fucker up. I emptied the whole 25 RD Butler Creek mag in about 3 seconds, I didn't even aim. My buddies woke up and started shouting and it was all chaos for half a minute. I tried to tell them what had happened as fast as I could. Having dropped my flashlight I didn't know if the creature had been hit or if it was there anymore. One of my buddies picked up the light and directed it at the direction I was pointing my gun at. And there it was, just standing. We didn't get a clear picture what it was, it didn't move or anything, it was just staring at us. It felt like a year, but in reality it must have been more like few seconds that we just stared at the fucker in terror. Suddenly the thing just kinda of falls down and starts slithering at us, making no noise at all. We start screaming, grab our packs and guns and start noping out of there. We must have ran like 10 kilometers straight up before taking a break. All of us were shaking, we didn't share a word. We walked the rest of the way to the public campground in Defcon 1, weapons ready and listening to every crack. I've never been as happy as I was when I saw some German tourists grilling sausages by their RV. They were all like WTF when we exited the woods with guns in low ready stance. We said nothing walked to our car and drove away breaking pretty much every speed limit on the way. We talked about the thing on the way home. None of us knew what it was but everyone had seen it and everyone was convinced that it was not a human nor a normal animal of any sort. We decided to stay away from the woods for a while. Last summer around the same area some berry picker was found dead, clawed open. The local police said it was clearly a bear or some canine animal that had killed the poor berry picker, but the problem is that the wildlife around here is scared of people, even children. And there hasn't been one bear sighting in over 80 years. Last summer we decided to be tough guys and find out what the hell that thing was. This time we would go with three ATVs, in case we would have to bail out fast. We took two cameras, three. 308s and 11276 with slugs, there were four of us at BTW, load of survival gear and one of my buddies managed to get a Gen 2 NV camera. We also had seven pipe bombs, black putter in 2 inches iron tubing with caps at the end plus visco fuse, in case shit got out of hand. Yay, it was kind of lame fake operator terror shit, but we thought we'd get all famous and shit if we actually killed it or got footage of it. Anyways, we entered the woods with our gear and headed for the facility. Again at the facility, everything looks normal and birds are singing again. No sign of anything abnormal. We decide to map the surrounding area and look for anything suspicious. Nothing was found, we make camp at the very same warehouse as we did the last time. Night falls and everything is still normal, we have guard shifts during the night but nothing happens. Next day we start exploring the woods area around the facility. We find a peculiar pile of dead trees, looked like someone had hauled them there. We take a closer look. The trees are arranged in a fashion similar to a fuck huge bird's nest. In the middle of the nest there is one half rotten moose carcass and a shitload of different animal bones. We start quietly noping back to our campsite. We park our ATVs next to the warehouse we keep our camp in. We enter the camp warehouse and see our camping gear all torn up, the somewhat expensive cameras smashed to against the floor, food taken and sleeping bags torn to pieces. Fuck. We take everything we could in like a minute and start driving the hell out of Dodge. It's evening by the time we get back to public campground. A police officer stops us by the gates and checks our gun permits. Then the officer proceeds by asking whether we wanted to volunteer for a search operation, our ATVs would be much appreciated. Some hiker had apparently gone missing in the nearby forest, 20 kilometers from the facility site. We look at each other and shake our head, 
one of my buddies quickly says something about being late and we drive out of there. The dude who went missing was never found. We decided that we wouldn't go in a woodsing in that part of the country anymore. Not going back there without infantry support and a fucking anti-material rifle. Still to this day we don't have a clue what that fucker was. Authorities have issued a warning that the woods around that area should be avoided because there are smaps all around and the risk of drowning in a swamp hole is big and that the facility area is unsafe to seize the structures have deteriorated, there is not one swamp in the area and the structures seem just fine to me. Anyways, I'm not going back there. That's it. I'll see if I find the article. I have several stories that happened in various states throughout the southwest. I will start with the least scary ones first. First one. Driving alone around 3 a.m. from Klein's Corners to Santa Fe. Be aware of cattle mutilations in the area in the past. See weird lights in the distance in some valley. Speed up and turn radio on to Christian music. Used to be Christian, not anymore. See extremely bright lights in random ass field. Look at sea lights that light up several acres set up like giant floodlights. See unmarked black vans in random field. Speed as fast as fuck out of there to get to I-25 intersection. Still do not know what the fuck was happening there to this day. Second story. Riding in a car with some people on a deserted road in north or New Mexico north of Santa Fe. Going through some mountainous areas and trying to enjoy the scenery. Looking out the window and then notice some black birds flying away as if something spooked them up ahead. Continue to look out at the landscape. Notice some odd looking rocks up ahead. As we approach the area where the rocks are we slow down since there is a curve. Look up and see a reptilian looking creature hiding behind rocks. Literally blink and think to myself, what the fuck was that? Did I really just see what I think I did? As soon as I blink it is not there. I was not drinking or smoking anything and never mentioned it to anyone else but I know what I saw. Okay I am going to continue with some more stories I have. This particular one was told to me from someone who was friends with the person that experienced this. 13,893,030 Maybe not in AJ but in the superstitions there is some crazy shit that has gone down which I will explain. Backstory on the superstition mountains east of Phoenix is that when this was a colony of Nuevo España, New Spain, the Spanish found a large cache of gold there. The local Apache Indians would often raid the Spanish settlements so the Spanish and the Pima Indians would send in scouts to look before they sent in to get the gold. Legends say that many times the mutilated remains of people would be found in and around the mountains. Fast forward to the 1840s when this was Mexico. Rich family from Sonora buys land grant to mine the area for gold. Begin to find large amounts of gold in the mountains. About a month later the Apache attacked and killed most of the Mexican settlers in the region. Fast forward to Arizona Territory in the 1880s. German immigrant, would later be referred to as Dutch, hence the name Lost Dutchman Mine, finds a huge chest of Spanish golden writings in Spanish explaining the location of the lost mine. He begins mining it and as he does he gets so much gold that he has enough money to live off of for the rest of his life so he buries the rest and hides the location of the mine until he is on his deathbed. The legend of the lost Dutchman's mine is well known to anyone who lives in Arizona or is from here. Fast forward to the 1970s. A local rancher who is also a state legislator decides to go searching for the gold. Apparently he was very wealthy and he paid for about 8-10 men to help him with finally finding the mine. The men set up camp somewhere about a mile from the location of the mine. They were armed to the teeth with guns and ammo since the area has lots of crazy ass animals like javelinas, bobcats and mountain lions. Each man carries either a .357 revolver or a shotgun with him at all times. During the night they each take turns on sentinel duty. After about the second day, they begin to find some small traces of gold so they know they are close. The next day they were exploring an arroyo, dry riverbed, and noticed some weird tracks. They have three points and look like claws on them and are a little larger than a human's. 
they think someone is playing with them or it is a large chakwala since some of them can get very big. That night they all hear what sounds like a woman screaming in the distance. They all think it must be a mountain lion. Anyone who has spent any time in the desert and has heard them knows they sound like that. They ignore it but still stay more alert that night since they think one is in the area. The next day they see below their camp the same strange prints that have three points and claws on the end of them. The camp is set up on a high ledge where they would have the best view and vantage point of anything coming near them. At this point they know something is watching them in the rancher. Senator who is playing for the expedition has more guns sent in and from what I was told has it flown by helicopter. Two additional men are there who will both be on guard during the night and they brought in some high powered flashlights. The next day they find several gold nuggets that were worth about a thousand dollars each so everyone in the camp is excited that they are very close. The evening approaches and two of the men are late getting into the camp. The other men start to worry that they got lost and decide to start looking for them. As the men set up looking for the other two lost men they spot them in the distance running up to them at full speed. Out of breath. They tell them that they heard some kind of weird growling noise coming from one of the small canyons in the mountain and they think they found a cave. About five of the men go and find the cave and document where it is but do not enter it since at this point is almost completely dark. As they shine their flashlights near the entrance they notice huge scratch marks as if some large animals clawed into the sandstone. They begin to get a little freaked out and head back to the relative safety of the camp since it is up on a ledge. On the way back they hear the same growling noise and they know something is following them. They reach the camp and tell the others about the situation. Once back at the camp one of the men who is supposedly ex-military tells everyone in the camp to shut the fuck and be quiet. He was a Vietnam veteran from I was told and he knew when they were being ambushed. The men in the camp hear what sounds like four or five men running in the canyon below them. They turn their spotlights on and see what they say was bipedal beings running around below the camp trying to find the way up on the ledge. They all begin to panic and not know what the hell is happening so they open fire on the creatures. The rancher, senator and the Vietnam veteran go down a little lower to get a better view and a better shot. As they do they see these creatures and notice they are about 4 or 5 feet tall and are definitely reptilian. The man who told me this said that the other men at the time thought they were some sort of giant lizards that was not scientifically documented. The Vietnam veteran falls down a cliff as he is aiming a sniper rifle and these creatures literally shred him apart. The rancher, senator unloads four of the hollow point point three five seven bullets into the creatures. Two of them fall down and as they do they let out a horrible scream that was almost deafening. They said that the air pressure changed as they screamed as if the atmosphere changed when they did. The rancher, senator who is now horrified that his body was literally just ripped apart shoots another bullet into the last creature. It begins to scream and stumble almost as if it was going to lunge at him. He decides he would rather save the last bullet to shot through his skull if he has to instead of being ripped apart. As the creature got to him he pointed the gun to his head and one of the other men with a shotgun shot it and it ran off in the canyon screaming. The other men leave the next day and swear not to talk about what happened until they can figure out a rational explanation. The men later agree that a mountain lion got the man who was killed and report it as a mountain lion attack. That was told to me by someone who was a well-known lawyer in the valley back in the day and would not lie. He said he knew some of the men personally and they would never make up a story like that. There is lots of real disappearances in and around those mountains each year. Even the Arizona State Park Service has acknowledged that there are more than usual amounts of people who disappear in the area and many of them are never found again and cannot be explained. Be driving with some friends in Oklahoma on an abandoned bridge. Going to try to scare some people in the car with another bro since there is nothing else to do in that horrible shithole. Start driving across long ass bridge and get through it to the other one that was supposedly haunted. Stop my car on the middle of the bigger and shorter bridge and turn off the engine and everyone gets out. Me and other friend make a plan that we will scare the others when they get back in the car. As we walk to the car me and another friend look at the train tracks below us beneath the bridge. 
We see something running way too fast to be a human but it looks like it is on two feet. It was too dark to really make out what it was. Start to legitimately get freaked out now. Look at my friend he saw it too. We both agreed to fuck scaring them and get out asses the hell out of there. As I get to my car I put the keys into the ignition and the car won't start. Everyone including my other friend thinks I am joking but I am not. The car for some freak reason really won't start. Finally after 4 or 5 tries it starts. As it starts my headlights come on and one of the passengers in the back who is the big guy starts screaming like a little girl. I ask what the fuck his problem is. He says he saw a robbed figure that looked like a maju according to him walking to the car. I do not see it but put the car in drive and drive the fuck out of there. As we leave the bridge there is a turn to go onto the main road and as we went past it we all saw a pair of red eyes glowing. I admit it was probably a raccoon or some kind of animal, but it still scared the shit out of us all. Never went back there at night. Be hiking in the desert in Arizona. Enjoying fresh air and watching the animals and just enjoying the vast open space and solitude where you can really think and come alive. Hiking by myself down in a small canyon and notice where either a bobcat or coyote have been eating the fruit that fall off of the saguaros in spring. Have camera with me and in my mind I think it would be cool to take some photos of a bobcat or coyote since I often see them so I am on the lookout. Sun begins to set and the sky looks amazing. Pro tip, Arizona has the most amazing sunsets in the world. So I am looking at the sky begin to slowly change from a bright blue to a yellowish orange and then a pink and violet blue color. Still enough light out to see the trail so I head back to the trail head. At this point I am about a mile from it and no one else that I am aware of is on the trail. I notice some petroglyphs and at first I thought it was some graffiti some nigger or asshole spray painted out in the desert. On closer inspection it is much too old and it is obvious it has been here for at least a couple of hundred years. It is not uncommon to find ancient petroglyphs in various places since the Native Americans left them behind. Get back up on the trail because I do not want to damage any of the native plants so I start walking back. About 10 minutes later this huge crow lands in the middle of the path. I walk a bit closer and it does not move and I am thinking it is really cool that it is not afraid of me. As I get closer I notice the black feathers have a purple shimmer to them as the last bit of the sunlight hits them. The bird literally is looking at me dead in the eye and it is almost as if it is looking deep within me and down to my soul. I felt no fear at all and in fact I felt very comfortable and relaxed. In a flash in my mind I literally could see the area from the past where the Native Americans were camping and I could hear them singing and dancing. I very specifically noticed the way they were dressed and I could tell it was not how some of the tribes dress today in ceremonial dress. It was more realistic and looked more handmade. As soon as I saw them I presume it was one of the older elders saw me and waved at me and smiled. As soon as he did it was over and it all happened in a split second but it felt as if time slowed down and even stopped. I know it sounds like a typical bullshit drunk Indian vision story but it was very real for me. I am part Cherokee and I have never had anything like that happen to me. I do not know if it was a vision quest or what but I want to know. If there are any Native Americans on the board. Real ones not the wannabe bullshit I am a 1 slash 100 Indian ones, then I would like to know what you think. I have talked to some Navajo friends and they have told me it was a vision of a past life I had which I could actually believe. Anyway, that is my last one for now unless this thread survives the next day or two I will post the last two. Me and my brother drove to this place at night long ago. Called the devil's throat outside Vegas far from Overton. We are driving and his car lights are faded and dim. Keep seeing these strange shadows objects. Wanting to piss my pants. See blue and purple lights small like little lasers. Could not be the helicopter's lights because it is closing time. That night was the 1999 Hector Mine earthquake. Smelled like burnt rock for a little while. Saw what I think was plasma shoot straight up from the hole. We run like mad and drive the fuck home. Never again. Also Lake Mead has the dead volcano, fortification hill, when the big earthquake hits Cali that shit will come back to life as the ones in the Mojave. 
Nature you scary. This is another story which was told to me by some people in the Arizona state government who would have nothing to gain from making a story up like this and instead would have a lot to lose due to people ridiculing them. The story goes as follows. About 10 years ago this person and his wife were in the backwoods area in a very isolated region not far from Sedona. They were planning on camping in the area and were looking for a nice place to set up camp. They hiked about three or four miles into the back country and were on government lands that belonged either to the Bureau of Land Management or the U.S. Forest Service. Anyway as they reached a clearing in a scenic spot they stopped and started to make camp. As they did they both felt very uneasy as if someone was watching them. The feeling began to get so intense they both decided to pack back up and hike a little further. As they did they came to an area where they heard lots of people talking but no one was around. While they were walking all of a sudden out of nowhere a large tank was sitting right in front of them running with about 20 military personnel running around in a frenzy. Curiously they approached the soldiers and asked what was going on and if it was some kind of exercise. Immediately they both had automatic rifles shoved into their faces and a barrage of questions came from an angry man in uniform. He very aggressively asked how the hell did you end up here and what are you doing here? The man threatened them with arrest and they both explained they were simply hiking and they came across this scene. The man explained he was a state official and well known and demanded to know what was happening. The military man still with a rifle pointed at them said this is none of you goddamned business and if you want to go back to your lives you better get the fuck out of here right now. So they both quickly packed up as quick as they could and left there. Now here is something that is strange. The man told me that on the military guy's shoulder was a symbol of a upside-down triangle with a snake in it. On the outside of the triangle was the earth. The patch said special forces and also had some kind of very strange writing he described as being like hieroglyphics. He later told me it reminded him of the symbols that they said they found at Roswell by the witnesses there. He said the tank was most likely an Abrams tank and that it did say a US Army on the side. He later asked someone in the State National Guard and he was told by that person that it was classified information that they did not know much about. But it had to do some kind of underground base and testing in the area. Once again this is only from what I was told and I did not witness it myself but when I was told the story it resonated as true to me since the person telling me had nothing to gain from it and I do not think they would want to make up such a story to bring unwanted attention onto themselves. Guess I'll post here since it's military related, but I'm just a civvy in life. Live in a village near a town, Doncaster. Near this village is a nature reserve. A while back, during World War II, a training flight crashed, I believe it was a bomber, into the lake bed. Only two deaths due to only two crew. One died on impact, other was found a little away from the site. Anyways the story now, it's about 6 p.m., taking my dog for a walk decide to go to the reserve since it's quiet there. Make my way in past the turn gates and towards the lake bed, used to be peat mine. Walk to other side of lake back into woodlands, dog suddenly just sits. Attempt to drag on lead, still firmly planted. Notice she is staring at something. Look over, out of the fucking denser woodland is a stumbling pilot. Doesn't even acknowledge me, dog yelps and nearly pulls me over as she attempts to run off. Pilot just stumbles by us, all bloodly and cut up. Get dog under control and follow after. No footsteps sounds nor any footprints in the bog near lake bed. Me and my dog share a look. GTFO. That is my only paranormal experience excluding family related stuff. The pilot though. His look was of pure terror, like he knew what he was replaying was his last moment. Well since you asked. About 24 at the time. Have a father who had been an alcoholic, somewhat severe, attempted to kill my mother one one occasion. He lives in a village next door to me. One day, just out in the nature reserve, my second home at the time pretty much. Now the following part I will state this. Am not a 100% believer of ghostly spirits and what not a skeptic to be honest, but I digress. Usually this place brings me feelings of relaxation and peace but this day was different. 
suddenly feeling of anxiety and am being watched. Try to shake it off, am a pretty lonely person tbh and this was a forest, I'd react poorly to a bloody kid looking at me. On the final dirt path to the familiar turn gates. I see dot 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 him web link thing. I honestly don't know how to describe this thing, but he was humanoid, have what looked like a really heavy yellow trench coat and some sort of hat tipped a bit downwards covering his face. We both just stare at each other for a few seconds. Suddenly his arm jerks forward, I mean snaps forward not smoothed into the potion like a regular person would. Points at me. At this point I thought I was gonna get stabbed and mugged by this person. Scared out my mind, I just fucking shot down, I just freeze up and hold my eyes closed. Awaiting the first or knife which never came, I open my eyes. He's gone, shrubbery not disturbed, no footsteps leading away, didn't even hear the fucker. Too scared to notice those facts at the time, I fucking run home. I'll be conned. The next part contains my personal part to it and why this thing plays a part in it. Get home, about 2 p.m. An hour passes by, still a bit shaken up by the encounter with that dot 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 thing. Trying to come up with reasons why there was no sounds of him going off, no footprints or disrupted shrubbery. Hear a car pulling up the gravel path outside. Peek ahead out of my living room window. My dad's car, think no biggie. He likes to drop by from time to time, I honestly can't remember the type of car now, but I know it had power assisted steering and it was diesel. Back door unlocked since I was in, hear him come and shouting my name. A bit startled by that, I know I hadn't pissed him off recently. He stumbles into the hallway leading into my living room. Immediately notice his wrists are caked in crimson red. About six slash marks on each wrist. Anon dot 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 I've made a terrible mistake. Those fucking words haunt me to this today. Now just for imagery now, there is a 6 feet man 40 year old man, wrists caked in blood, on verge of tears dripping blood onto my cream carpet. Panic a little bit managed to stay on top of it. Run to phone and call 999 and go to kitchen and grab my emergency first aid kit and give him it. Since I'm actually clueless and still a bit of shock I leave it up to him to sort himself while emergency services arrive. Due to nature of where I live, it took them 20 minutes to arrive. Right, with that out of the way, here comes the spook again. After the event, I talked to my dad about it, at first he was hesitant and ashamed, but I managed to get him to talk about it. First, while driving the car to where he went to perform the act. He managed to damage it so that the power steering wouldn't work, found that after he sent it in for a checkup since it was quite visible it was damaged from just looking. While actual in the act of cutting himself, he noticed exact same figure I had seen at the nature reserve. He described exactly how I saw him, except that whatever it was had a grin on its face and watched him do it. After my dad had been carted into the back of the ambulance and taken to hospital it appeared one last time. Walking back from my garden gate to home's back door, I used that as my main entrance instead of the front door, never known why. Looking straight down, you can see a bit around the corner to my garden and the garden shed is just dead ahead down the path. It's just standing in front of the shed. Stares me down like he did before, intense anxiety and panic like before. Don't close my eyes this time, and try to man up. Instead of a grin or a blank expression, he just looks at me with a disappointing look. Disappointing that my dad hadn't managed to kill himself. Walks silently off to the left and to my garden and out of view. Bolt in my house and into my kitchen and look out of the window and there. No sign of him again. Go to door, lock it. Close blinds and curtains around windows of house. Sit in living by phone for a call from hospital. Now as I mentioned earlier I think. I am a bit of skeptic about this sort of stuff, but the fact this thing was appearing in broad daylight caused me to become more of an believer in paranormal stuff. I did some research into it afterwards and all I found out it was sort of omen, for warning? And it feeds of negative events going on. From what I deduced, it was know what was going on with my dad, and was ready for a fest of energy, 
but something else that day was looking over my dad as man with stilted wrists, managed to drive a damaged, now non-power assisted car all the way to my house without dying on the way there. So yeah, that's about it, I always keep my blinds and curtains downstairs closed if there is nobody in except me and doors locked, as I fear if this bugger comes back with more malicious intent, heck I'm worried writing this might attract him back, haven't seen him about 4-5 years now, that's when my dad attempted suicide. Addendum to it, what I never got is why it wanted to fuck with me, I wasn't planning anything that day unless he wanted to a fucking side order of energy or whatever by making me feel bad, scared. Oh, that's you? Fair dues, I've been following M2. Right I'll start off with one that is still going to this day, not exquisitely pants staining but still unnerving. If you go to my garden, Break through my left set of fences and take dot 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 what may be five steps, you're into a field, owned by a farmer of course. Due to the close promoxity of the field, I can to an extent, if anybody is talking in there or stuff been moved about, farming equipment and whatnot. now here is the strange part. Since about two three years ago, the alarm system in that place is always goes off about 3 am in the morning. He has it in place to stop people crossing the field into his actual animal storage area, you'd be surprised how many people actually steal chickens and whatnot. Now I'd normally put it down to a fox trying to find a free meal and tripping the alarm, but as I mentioned, 3 years running, always 3 am, boom I hear the alarm, think of an air raid siren, but much quieter and more dot 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 enough to grab your attention but not wake you up at night. Only once have I ever caught a glimpse of anything in there with the alarm going off. Green texting for effect now. B255 AM. Downstairs in kitchen digging around for a late night snack. Five minutes pass, can be picky sometimes, alarm goes off like clockwork. About two years at this point. Even though it's pretty much pitch black, take a look out at the kitchen window. Security light goes on. Some vaguely humanoid outline shape is just running towards the road, between my fence and field boundary. Scared me shitless at first, considering my previous story of what's happened here, you'll know why. But in the end, it really could have been some fucking animal thief which fucked up and was just running off. Second tale from the soil coming up. This one is a combination of nature, my reflection and whatever the fuck loves to walk around in my attic. Average English weather, raining and storming. Been like this for a few days now. Another night in effect about 8 p.m. Boot up computer, play some video, browse slash v for a while and come to slash x for some good old fashioned pasta. About 10 o'clock, storm still raging, even the odd crack of lighting. Reading some pasta, crack of thunder very close to me. Jerk my head around. Turn back and notice something in the reflection in the front of my computer case, shiny black plastic, so it's easy enough to see background of my room in it. Get scared, lunge back, so does reflection. Oh it's just me. Another flash of lighting, so close it actually lights up my room a bit. As this happen, hear thump in attic. This in the place of the attic where there are no floor boards, so if you step onto the insulation, you'll fall right into my room. Be a brave man and go up there holding a flashlight and carrying my cat. Open door which leads to the already forementioned no floor board area of the attic, I use the boarded parts for general storage. Cat doesn't sense anything, so I feel a bit better. Open door, peer head in. I find a Pringles can, yes you read it correctly, a fucking Pringles can. I know this bit was clear, as I had previously poked my head in here after I moved in. Power cut. Lovely countryside power lines. Stuck in my attic, with a thunderstorm, with a fucking ghostly old kin of Pringles and my cat. Like the big man I was, I actually curled up in the corner, with my cat on me and fell asleep. To this today, I really don't know what causes the creaking in my attic as it sounds more like footsteps on the attic floor than actual creaking which worries me. Sorry they aren't amazing shit bricks stuff, am just posting all the memories I've dredged up. 
Three stories, two military related. 1. I studied Russian and mathematics at university. A lot of people joked that it'd make me a good cryptographer, and I always laughed along with them. In the end, though, I did work in the security services, I started off in the RAF, which had always been my dream, to be a pilot. It must have been around 2006 when I had my first solo flight at night. I was just flying a light prop plane, glider hybrid. It was just me in the plane. At first it started off small. I could hear feedback through my radio, just static, really. I didn't pay much attention to it, because sometimes frequencies clash and you get a little feedback. I carried on with my sortie which was just six hours of night flying from one air base in Scotland to one in England, going over the Atlantic as a patrol. The feedback started getting worse, more white noise. At this stage, I was probably about 10 kilometers away from the coast. I quickly radioed into base, and asked if they knew why I was getting so much feedback. They said it was fairly common, but if it got worse, to let them know. By the time this exchange is over, I'm basically over the coast, and the radio is literally so loud with white noise I have to take off my headset, because the noise of the aircraft is quieter than the radio white noise. I'm about okay, I'm out to sea, going towards the Netherlands, following a routine patrol path, when my radio goes dead. Completely dead. I decide flying without my radio is too big a risk to take, because I'll probably get shot when I come into land. I decide I'll go back to base in Scotland, where they know the aircraft. As soon as I get back to the mainland, the radio switches back on. I think nothing of it, but as soon as my radio switches on again, base are grilling me about why I changed flight plans and wouldn't report in, so I tell them my issue. They're a bit confused, but tell me to carry on with my flight plans but if it carries on, to return to base. So I head back out to sea again, and the radio builds up white noise, and the aircraft becomes more twitchy, it's almost like the aircraft itself is afraid of the ocean. Where the air was smooth minutes before, it's now turbulent, and the planes bucking and rolling all over the place. The white noise increases again, but I don't take off my headset this time. Eventually everything settles down, and we're probably about 20 kilometers out to sea, and I start turning in a wide arc which will take me to England. The white noise had just become more like pops and fizzes occasionally. The more I listened to the fizzing, the more I thought I could hear whispers, a little tinny hissy voice through the radio. I radioed bass and let them know I was getting interference. As I radioed bass, I could hear the interference even more, it sounded like something underwater, it's hard to explain, but just the noise of water drifting past receiver, almost like scuba diver noises. It's so loud, the noise is spilling into my headset smick, and I can hear the echo of it coming back to me from the base. At this stage, I could hear the tech on duty noping all over the place, because that wasn't normal interference, and he said he'd get my CO to talk to me. By now things are getting really weird in the aircraft. I can definitely hear a submerged voice through the watery interference, but it sounds like it's almost from the World War II era, a very posh voice underwater begging for help in distress. Lights are flickering on and off all over my plane, my strobe lights are turning on and off, my landing lights are turning on and off, and I notice they're going to a pattern. The lights are on for three long sessions, then three short sessions. That's a distress signal. Suddenly, my flaps change themselves, and I can feel myself losing altitude as if I'm in a stall, and the altimeter is showing me I'm losing about 600 meters a minute, which isn't a massive amount, but is a cause for alarm. I manually try to adjust the flaps, but I can't, it feels like they're locked in place and I look outside to the flaps, whilst the lights are on, and in the brief flash of the lights, I can see a man in full World War II pilot regalia holding on to the wing, one hand outstretched towards my cabin. The light goes off, comes back on, he's gone. By now my CO is on, and he can hear how much distress I'm in. I've kept my visions to myself, because otherwise they'll think I'm loony, 
and my CO is telling me I'm sleep deprived and probably a bit starved of oxygen, and to relax. I do so. After seeing the man, the plane seems to sort itself out a bit, and stop acting funny, though both me and my CO can hear the interference, and it sounds like sobs coming through now, watery wobs. I can hear him freaking out a little bit, as he quietly and discreetly asks Tex if they can clear up the signal, or if they know what it is. It's nothing he's ever heard before, as interference, anyway. I'm getting closer to the coast now, probably about 6 kilometers away, when I have a sudden, total, engine failure. My aircraft is a glider hybrid, so I can fairly easily just glide it along, especially as I'm by the coast and there's a lot of thermals. So I'm gliding along, when the flaps thing happens again, but more aggressively. I'm now losing about 1000 meters in altitude every minute, which is a lot, especially when I'm only about 3000 meters above sea level as it is, and gliding. I'm essentially plummeting to earth. I can't change the flaps, it feels like they're locked into place. For the next minute I'm just ramming the gear as hard as I can to try and get some lift from my flaps. I'm starting to contemplate bailing, because I'm essentially dealing with total mechanical failure. My altimeter says I'm only about 1000 meters above sea level when I can adjust my flaps again. I'm in a semi-stall now, and to get out of it is going to take about 500 more meters of altitude, but it's either that or bailing, so I give it a shot. Now, I have a very strong recollection of, spinning completely out of control, a stall which was completely unmanaged, and seeing lights beneath me, and the sea, a solitary bright light, my own lights are dead, so it's not a reflection. As I'm spinning closer, I can see the lights are where they'd be on a plane. It's like a plane is underwater with all its lights on. I remember, my lights suddenly kicking on, a quick sudden strobe flash, illuminating the pilot from before holding on to my poor twing, looking forlornly at me. He's closer this time, and I can see seaweed entwined in his headset, barnacles on his outstretched glove, water dripping from his sleeve. I watch horrified as the interference comes back, and I can hear the last moments of a pilot crashing into the water. Bass can hear the interference too. The Spectre's hand grabs onto my cockpit opening lever, which is when I realize I have engines back again, and I can overpower the stall. The maneuver seems to take the Spectre by surprise, and his hand misses the lever, and slaps the Pyrex cockpit hood instead. Next thing I remember is calmly flying across from the coast to land. I'm not sure if I blacked out from the stall, and my aircraft just regained equilibrium as the gliders are designed to, and I hallucinated the entire thing, or whether it actually happened. The aircraft's working like a dream now. I radio base to tell them it's fine and I've nearly chalked up another sortie, what what. My CO is relieved and says he'll debrief me in the morning. As I come into land, I look out my port side just to check there's nothing around me, which is when I see the imprint of a hand on my Pyrex cockpit. A small trail of seaweed stuck fast to it, too. A few weeks later at an inquest, the official line given was that the radio picked up interference from a radio program which was airing, and my aircraft suffered a complete electrical and mechanical failure until which normally would have been devastating, yet due to my skill and determination, had managed to successfully keep my head in a dicey situation, and avert a disaster. My CO, over a few drinks told me that due to RAF budget cuts, some of their trainer aircraft had parts cannibalized from other aircraft. Mine, in particular, had props, flaps, and other salvaged materials from the World War II aircraft which had crashed into the ocean. A Navy salvage ship managed to recover most of the wreckage, floating on the sea's surface, but the pilot had drowned, trapped in the cockpit. It was pretty freaky at the time. This is my second story. 2. My superiors were impressed I could keep a level head in a terminal situation. After training I was assigned to the Army Air Corps to fly helicopters. I was one of the last RAF pilots to be assigned to the AAC, which had a much higher mortality rate than the RAF, the AAC deployed soldiers by helicopter, etc. The RAF just shot a few missiles and shit every now and then from 10 kilometers away. 
I'm flying the shitty Lynx. It's an okay helicopter, it's agile and can go quite fast, but it's old as fuck, and after Chinooks, it gets shot down the most. Unlike Chinooks, light arms fire can actually penetrate it and damage it. Anyway, I'm flying a squad of eight soldiers, in a mission that reeks of black ops. My usual observer is dropped, so some army bigwig can brief his men. That's already pretty strange. I'm given no information about the mission, other than transport this cargo to this location by this time. They're going far away from base, and I'll be dropping them off in the Wakhan corridor, from where they can go into either Tajikistan or Pakistan, and also an area where there's fuck all civilization and a lot of mountains, so probably lots of training comps and outposts of insurgents. I'm not really worried, this is fairly routine. Every six months or so a pilot will say they dropped off an unmarked cargo near the Tajik or Pakistani border. I've got pretty used to Afghanistan now, but as most pilots secretly are, I'm pretty superstitious, and the pilots who have been here for longer have told us some folklore, from the basic dune whistle at night or the snakes, demons will get you, to flashes of light in the mountains, thermal imaging which shows heat of people where there are none, or your everyday gin fucking with you. I just pass off their stories as that, just stories, but tonight something just feels wrong. The air is heavy and humid with expectation. I've got a knot of anticipation in my stomach, and as I fly closer to the Tajik border, the anticipation is growing. I decide to switch to thermals so the observer can be useful and make sure I'm not about to be shot by an rebounds per game wielding goat fucker. I'm about to be especially vulnerable, as I'm going to hover around 50 meters off the ground for around a minute as the cargo deploys itself. I'm coming in to drop them off, and the observer's briefing them, and I'm trying not to listen, as I keep an eye on the thermal, staying at an altitude of about 800 meters while slowly rotating 360 degrees to do a full sweep. At around 270 degrees into my sweep, I see a massive blotch of heat on the steps print off, around the way I'm not rotating. Something that big has to be either a horse, or a bear, and I whip around quickly to see what it is, causing the cargo to lose their balance and swear at me. I catch the thing in the camera again, but it sprints off the other way, like it's teasing me, almost. I whip around again causing them to swear even more at me, and I managed to catch it square into the camera. It was like a horse, but a horse standing on two legs, with its knees bent backwards like a flamingo. Its upper body was very warm, and it lacked a neck. Eyes are quite easy to make out on thermal, and as I zoomed in, it lacked a neck, or head, really, and it just had eyes staring out of its chest. Its arm limbs were long, stretching down from its shoulders to its knees. At that moment, the army bigwig saw it. I know he saw it, because I heard the sharp intake of breath as his brain tried to comprehend what it was. He looked at me, and I looked at him, and he just very slightly shook his head. I guess to say you never saw this, okay? Turning around, to the cargo, he just nodded to them. As we flew off, I could see the multiple flashes on the ground of sustained heavy arms fire, submachine guns and the such. The bigwig and I sat in silence. As the sun began to rise, I saw a big flash of light behind us, from where we dropped off the soldiers, a massive shaft of blue lights, which exploded outwards. I saw a silver cigar fly out of the top of it, towards the heavens. I was wide-eyed, confused starting to sweat nervously, a cold chill despite the heat inside the helicopter. I looked at the army guy, but he just shook his head. He didn't say anything. Just looked stern, and shook his head at me. I remember asking him what it was, what the fuck had I got into, and he just said we had to contain a situation on the ground. I didn't ask, but I knew better than to tell people, besides, if I did, who'd believe me? I picked up the soldiers a few weeks later. They were all horribly sick with radiation poisoning. I think one died, but I can't be sure. A few of them were blind. Their fatigues were all ripped and bloodied, with some kind of liquid metal stained on it. My third story. 3. I was a child. 
I woke up uneasy in the night for no reason, at perhaps 3 or 4 am, against my furthest wall, I could see a shadow, or more accurately, a silhouette of a man. The man was tall. The man was wearing a hat, and a long coat. If I looked at him with my eyes open, he would, kind of jump towards my bed. A foot or so closer, every second. Just, against the wall, then bam, halfway to me in the end of my bed, bam, at the end of my bed. I'd close my eyes, and he'd be back against the wall. Oddly, the covers were off me. I was a child that needed covers to sleep. I knew if I could get my duvet over me, I'd be safe again. So I very slowly, and carefully, with my eyes squinted, watching him, trying to pull my duvet over me, in a way so slow it couldn't draw attention to me. The entire time, he was watching. I knew he was watching, he knew exactly what I was doing. He knew, without a doubt, and he was loving it. I could tell, he was enjoying the fear, and stress, and negative energy he was inflicting on me, a child. He wanted me to be scared, he meant for me to be scared of him, it was evil, pure malevolence radiated from him. I didn't know what would happen if he ever came up close to me, but I wasn't prepared to find out. Eventually I got the duvet over myself, and just watched him through closed eyes, terrified, until the sun came up. And as the sun came closer to him, he just dot 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 stepped backwards through the wall. It's hard to explain. House sitting. Fiance spooked from bathroom door slamming while we are in living room. Find that the bathroom door closes itself all the time. Fiance spooked too easily and has bad dreams. Next night she is scared about the idea of someone coming through the window to murder us, lol. But the house was on a large bit of land so no neighbors within earshot. Get protective because didn't know house well and area well. Staying up late reading sign language book. Your door close, must be bathroom. Feel this got turning feel over bathroom, stairs area. Ask out loud for it to communicate. Suddenly feel cold. Twitching a bit in my seat from adrenaline rush. Say to use book to talk to me. Ask it what it is. I shit you fucking I open to a random page with a kid doing a sign for demon. Ask it what it wants. Open to page with woman doing sign for rape. Throw book across room, plead it to not bother us and that it was our last night before we be out of its way. Sleep fine. Leave next day with no issues. Sadly the house doesn't seem to be haunted, been there again trying to prompt a response and got nothing. Now, I had a very good friend who I'll call Sherlock, because he believed very much in similar philosophies to Sherlock, as in, deductive reasoning, the purity of a priori logic. I've heard him over the radio when he's being shot at and having RPGs fired at him, and he sounded as calm and relaxed as somebody on holiday in an ice cream shop, specifying what flavor they wanted, for example Cucumber Crisp 071, I'm under fairly heavy sustained fire, it looks like part of my fuselage just gave way, over. That sort of thing. I'm fairly sure he was slightly autistic, because he'd just wait until base told him to pull out or whatever. He also had no mercy. If he had authorization to fire, he'd light them up. No qualms, no limitations. Anyway, I've seen Sherlock quake like a fucking leaf in the winter wind. It must have been around 3 a.m., and there was fuck all to do. I was playing poker against the computer and winning, another friend of mine reading Kant on my bed, when he walked into my room. Pretty unusual, because he always knocked. He delivered some supplies to an outpost about 70 kilometers away from the main base. Not deep in hostile territory, but hostile enough that you'd expect an RPG or two when you supply them, or took out the wounded which is mainly what Sherlock did, even volunteering to do it. He'd sat down in the afternoon, and helped unload the supplies, mainly medical, ammunition, and tools, and stuck around taking requests from the co, who was running low on water and water purification tablets. A few privates were on duty in the dusk, and one of them freaked, saying he could see something through thermals that he couldn't see in person. 
This piqued Sherlock's curiosity so he had a look. Sure enough, when he looked through thermals, he could see the shape of a man about 200 m down the path but looking with binoculars, couldn't see anything, even with night vision. This is quite common in Afghanistan. It's reported uncommonly. Despite being an uncommon event, it's always quite unnerving when it happens, but according to Sherlock, he wasn't unnerved, just his deductive reasoning pricking up. First he thought the thermals were dodgy, so he used another set, then another set. Then he thought the binoculars were bad, so he used another pair, which weren't just thermal imaging, but infrared night vision, rather than the shitty green tinted type, it was a grayscale type, which showed significant detail. Now, on the infrared grayscale he could see it, apparently it was a human in everything other than having a head. The body was human, perfectly proportioned, but there was no head. Now, the other night vision didn't show this. Sherlock, armed with nothing other than our standard issue Browning high power, and probably just a single magazine, strolled 200 meters down the path to see if he could see anything. Apparently not, though he said it felt unusually chilly, and he did feel quite uneasy. It was on his way back, when he heard soldiers shouting. Looking behind him, he saw four or five putrefied bodies shambling after him. He described the smell as rancid and their look as if they had contracted the vilest leprosy. They were moving pretty quickly, and he could see body parts, fingers, hands, even an entire arm, drop off. When he said they were like the walking dead I felt a chill go up my spine, and my friend reading Kant actually looked up at us. Sherlock said he shouted a warning to the bodies, apparently rotting as if dead for a few days, appendages and torsos swollen from the sun, and as they continued to gain ground on him, began opening fire. Despite one of them being hit several times, losing most of its shoulder, and through the stomach, it single-mindedly continued pursuing Sherlock, who, for the first time ever, sprinted away. A rifleman at the outpost shot them with a more high-powered weapon, and killed, re-killed, one of them. As soon as one of them went lifeless, the others would single-mindedly stuff their faces full of flesh, just tearing it off limbs and bodies. No shame, no disgust. Like they hadn't eaten for days. At this point, the fellow reading Kant, piped up. He'd heard of similar stories in his journeys to outposts, some American soldiers, badly injured and delirious in the sun, told him how they had seen their brothers in arms set upon by filthy Mujahideen, and ripped apart, alive. Limbs ripped from bodies, heads from necks, and how they would rip the flesh off with their long-nailed fingers, gouging it out, or bite it off the bones. They had said only fire or high-velocity weapons, not small arms, could stop them. Afghan soldiers, when mortally wounded, prefer to kill themselves than be captured, because they've heard the stories and know the folklore, it is true they kill themselves. I've seen it. I must also admit, as I became more experienced and hardened to the oddness of Afghanistan, I also heard quite a few of these stories myself, to the point where they don't even worry me anymore. I think I even saw a herd of them rampage through a village. But it's Afghanistan, so they could have been tripping on opiates. Be Marine in Monterey Decide not to take leave for Christmas because I'm a retard. Naturally I get stuck on duty every other day. Duty is 24 hour shift checking the barracks once an hour. Christmas Eve, getting briefed by the duty NCO. Gives me a roster, no bodies in the barracks I'll be at since they all took leave. My only job is to make sure that no one breaks in and uses the building to get drunk or fuck. Spend the next 12 hours fapping and watching movies. It's about 2300 and I hear footsteps above me. Grab the duty hammer and rush out of the duty hut to catch whoever's up there. There's only one stairway leading up to the second and third deck so they'd have to jump or go by me. I get to the second deck and start looking around. Common room was empty but the light was turned on. Look around a bit more, check the third deck just in case and head back down. Nothing happens the next few hours, I'm watching Superbad or some shit. Greater than 1am rolls around and I hear a door slam above me. Grab the duty hammer and head back upstairs. 
This time I don't rush into either door since I wasn't sure which door got slammed. Waiting by the stairs trying to be sneaky and catch whoever's in there. Greater than 5 minutes go by and I head up, still trying to be sneaky. 2 ND deck is good. 3 RD deck has a light on. The only way to open the outside doors is with a key card that's keyed individually to everyone that lives in the barracks and the master key, which I had. Start checking every room. No lights are on, no one hiding in the rooms as far as I could tell. Sigh and make sure every light is off, every door is closed and locked. Do the same for the second and first deck. Debate recording it in the logbook, but since I hadn't actually caught anyone I wrote that all was secure. After all, all was secure. Greater than 330 or a little bit before. Fog has rolled in. This isn't unusual because Monterey is right off the ocean. But this fog was really thick. I couldn't see 10 feet above me, or the third deck from the first floor. Doing my hourly tour and notice something in one of the windows on the third deck. A light is blinking on and off in there, not like a room light but a smaller one, like a flashlight. I've got you now fucker. Head up the stairs as quietly as I can and open the door. The room was the first one on the left on the inside of the barracks, there's no way they could have gone anywhere. Throw the door open and flick the lights on. Trying to surprise whoever it was, but the room is empty again. Look everywhere in this room, there's absolutely nothing. Rooms aren't very big either so it's not like there's a lot of ground to cover. Decide after 10 minutes that I'm just hallucinating from lack of sleep or something. Close the door and turn to go back downstairs when I notice the door on the far end of the hall was ajar and the light was on. Head for it. This fucking room's empty too, but I know for a fact that all the doors have been closed and all the lights have been off. I eventually got relieved by one of the only other marines left on base and went to bed in my own, non-haunted barracks. I asked around to some of the marines that lived in that barracks normally without sounding too crazy. Most of the rooms were empty as is, and only a handful of marines lived there normally. But people always heard noises or doors slamming, toilets flushing, or windows closing in the empty rooms. Most of the time it was just marines looking to screw the girls or drink away from their roommates, but that's all I got. Be on a road trip with my dad and my sister. I was like 8 years old. Dad drives through a deserted field, or a sandy hill of some sort. I can't really remember. We stopped to take a pee. After I was done I noticed that there are bones buried on the sand. At that time bones looked cool to my childish eyes so I picked few of them up. They were small, like cat tear small. I noticed that there were bones everywhere I watched. I ran bit further and examined the soil. Bones. They were really white like bones normally are. Dad was done peeing so we had to go on. He didn't let me take any of the bones because they were too dirty. The only time I have been on desert. Live in Vegas area. I'm a delivery guy for a special package service. Get told I'm delivering an unusual package that requires special care, and get told all sorts of special precautions for meeting the recipient. Weird, but I'm getting paid anyway so whatever lol. Oddly enough, the guy who is supposed to deliver this package before me backed out. Getting mad vibes off this package but I carry on. Early evening. Traveling along the I-15, constantly feeling like I'm being tailed or watched from within the desert, there is hardly anyone else on the road. Eventually, I take a bathroom break in a small town, I stop off at the general store to buy some snacks. As I'm about to continue my journey I hear a weird noise coming from the bushes, and swear I hear a PSST. I investigate, Suddenly out of nowhere this dude wearing animal furs hits me with some kind of bat, I double over. I black out. I wake up. My wrists are bound and I ache like hell. I look up and see a person size hole in the ground. Oh shit. I hear a voice. Look who's waking up over here. Some guy wearing a checkered suit lights a cigarette. Turns out the game was rigged from the start. He shoots me. What the fuck man? Well I posted this one in a thread last night so you may have seen it before, but I'll post it again because it was pretty creepy. Bored one night. Decide to go out driving. Come up to road I've always been curious about, so I decide to go down it. This road is off of a main road, but the road itself starts as a wooded road. 
eventually turns into a kind of residential area. Driving through residential area, eventually turns wooded again. Normal road ends at a dirt road. My car sucks on dirt roads, and it looked pretty sketchy, so I turn back. A few days later I tell my friend about going down the road. She's confused, says that road goes to another town nearby. We decide to go out that night and drive down it again, because I know what I saw. Driving down the road, same stuff for the most part. Eventually come to parts of the road I don't remember. Road leads us to the town she was talking about. The dirt road was nowhere to be found, and I kept an eye out for it or a similar road. Still not sure what happened that first night. Not gonna green text for this one. Moved to this place in NY when I was a kid. It was a big property with five houses owned by the landlord, and a bunch of woods surrounding it. First, there was this abandoned foundation along the road up to the houses. It looked like it had been abandoned for decades. I went exploring in it with some friends, and we climbed our way down into the basement area. There was mostly just rubble in there, but I also found this really creepy doll with all of its limbs missing partially buried in the rubble. Of the five houses on the property, four were occupied. The fifth was the one where the landlord's family used to live. Exploring with some friends another day, we decided to go check out that house. First of all, there was an abandoned pool right by it, like a typical community kind of pool from the 50s or something. Nothing too creepy about it besides that though. Looking into the house, we see it was full of furniture. We looked in all the windows we could, and we found the dining room. The table was there, and the table was set as if dinner was about to be served any minute. We never knew why all this shit was in there and they just picked up and left leaving everything in there. While living here, I had the most nightmares out of any place I've ever lived. I seriously must have had nightmares almost every night about one thing or another, zombies, demons, possessed family members. The thing about these dreams, though, was that they were all super clear. I can remember them all to this day. Most dreams you forget, and the locations they take place in are distorted memories from your subconscious, or at least they are for me. Not these dreams. They all took place on this property, exactly the way it was. As soon as we moved away, the nightmare stopped instantly. My family and I felt like this place must have been built on a Native American burial ground. One night, my mom was up and heard children playing outside, kind of chanting in some unknown language. The problem with this? It was about 3 a.m., and when she looked outside, there was no one to be found. Another night, I heard footsteps coming from upstairs walking back and forth. My cat must have heard them too because he was watching where the sound was coming from intently. I went to ask my mom if she heard anything, and she was listening to it as well. The problem with this? We didn't have an upstairs. And these were heavy footsteps that had to have been made by something big, nothing that could fit in the tiny crawl space above the house. On the side of our house was a fenced in garden. My mom had tried growing various types of plants in it for years, but nothing would ever grow. One winter, we got a decent snowfall. As the weather started to warm up, most of the snow started to melt, obviously. But the snow in this garden didn't melt for a long time. Even though the garden got plenty of sun, and the snow was melted right next to the fence, right where the fence separated the garden from the rest of the area, the snow was just there. But by far the creepiest thing about this place though had to have been the lake in the middle of the property. Not sure if this was a natural lake, or if it was man-made. There was an island in the middle of it, with a bridge leading to it. The path to the bridge went through a portion of the woods that seemed to close in on you. The island was normal for the most part, except for one abnormality. There was this big concrete slab towards the far end of the island. It was clearly a lid covering to another part of concrete that went into the ground of the island. Even weirder, there was a giant boulder on top of the slab. This boulder was fucking big, there's no way any human could move it without the help of a machine. I don't know how a machine big enough to lift that boulder got onto that island, if that's even what was used to lift the boulder, and I certainly don't know what the slab was covering that required a huge boulder to keep shut. 
I live in Pittsburgh, in a wooded suburban area called Fox Chapel. B10. Sleeping with my siblings in a big bed. Awake, just staring at the ceiling and watching how the darkness in the room changes as I focus on a darker area in the room versus a lighter area. All of a sudden an extremely bright light white illuminates the attached room, it's like an office with a window that faces the backyard. It really was like a light you would see when a car points at your house, but there weren't any roads where the light came from. Just my backyard and about two acres of woods. All of a sudden I am 100% frozen, can't move anything, can't scream. Very similar feeling to sleep paralysis. Three beings, tall, slender with a slight gray appearance that was difficult to discern because my head was laying down and I had to point my eyes downward to see them walking past the foot of my bed and over to where I was sleeping. I sense them standing next to me, all of a sudden I feel my back leave the bed and I swear I am levitating 2-3 feet above the bed. I am so fucking scared at this point, I have literally never been so scared in my entire life, and this is why I remember this evening so well. Next thing I know it is morning, my family has already woken up in our downstairs. I'm the only person that had this experience. Also in that house two separate times near that same age I would be either sitting or laying with my back up to something and would blink very normally but when I opened my eyes, many hours had passed. Always happened at night and after blinking it would be daytime. Very strange shit. My older sister had a similar thing happen to her with the blinking and hours passing by. I'm also from Pittsburgh. This isn't related to the outdoors, but I feel it's worth posting anyway. When I was in high school a place got popular named Kane Hospital where kids would get high, drunk, go exploring, hang out, act. It was actually just the site of where the hospital once stood. The ground level and floors above had been demolished and removed some time ago, the 70s I believe. This left only the weathered and overgrown cement foundation of what the building had once been. Openings that once must have been stairwells, now only mounds of gravel and twisted metal, led to the levels of the building that lay within the ground. Even during day it is absolutely pitch black down there. We would need to bring flashlights and make sure we had enough batteries, because being lost down there without light would be, well, obviously terrifying, but also a real danger, considering how expansive it was. We never even figured out how many levels were down there, because the third was so badly flooded that it made further exploration nearly impossible. There were all sorts of antiquated and rusted hospital equipment just laying around. Lots of it was mundane, stretchers, wheelchairs and the like, but there were also stretchers fitted with restraints and masks, like the one Hannibal wore in Silence of the Lambs. There was also a couple quarters with confinement rooms. Rusting iron doors two inches thick, with huge bars to lock them from the outside, as well as the sliding peepholes. Perhaps most bizarre, an old rusting car just sitting on in an expansive room of the second level basement. We have absolutely no idea how it could have even gotten in there. Apparently the attached image was taken on the third floor. As you can imagine, there are countless stories of strange happenings, and mine is as follows. We secured a room for ourselves on the second level. It had a few old chairs, a desk, and we brought candles, a radio, pot, other stuff. One day a group of about five of us were hanging out when we heard a distant clanging. At first we ignored it, but it became louder. As we were debating whether we should stay put and be quiet the noise continued. It sounded like something metal was striking some of the pipes exposed and throughout. It was drawing nearer. We also heard voices accompanying it, but nothing discernible. The speech was gibberish, and would come in violent outbursts, accompanying the declanging, and growing louder and closer. I have seldom been so horrified. At one point someone panicked, ran, and then the rest followed, one of us repeating to run and keep moving. We got out through a ladder that we never noticed led to the surface. I think that was the last time I visited. Kane Hospital grew in notoriety and was a frequent hangout spot of young kids, which eventually drew the cops' attention, and I believe it is now inaccessible. That was probably around 8 or 9 years ago. 
I found the attached images by googling Kane Hospital Pittsburgh, if you want to try to figure out anything else. Also in before I get cancer from asbestos poisoning. I can one-up you. Work at summer camp. 25 staff. One cook. One caretaker and their families. Have nicknames. I'm Finn. Cook is flubber cause she's fat. Her kid is named Black cause he's an emo shit. Black likes to draw. One day find body of mouse. It been killed by a cat. Throw it away. Over the next five weeks, more dead shit escalating in size. Brutality as well. Guts pulled out. Skin cut and ussels exposed. Laid out with broken arms strecked wide. By the fifth week there was a pentagram done in blood and guts. Have staff meetings about it over the sewer. About not doing this shit and whoever doing is beads to stop or be fired. We talk to Black Cos we know it's his emo ass. You wouldn't talk to me that way if you were smart. Nope. Seriously, kid. If it's you you need to fucking stop, it'll tell your mother. Don't bother. She's smart. Double nope. Talk to boss. Agrees need to talk to Flubber I the morning. Wake up go down for breakfast. Senior staff is cooking. Flubber left in the middle of the night. No warning. Super unlike her. She was a happy-ish person but she was super professional and wouldn't ever do that. Screaming from behind cook hall. Run to see. Find Vertaker's dog nailed to the wall. It's behind the cook hall, nobody can see it it's shrouded by trees. Big pentagram around it. Its shoulders are dislocated to be pasted in an upside down cross. Flip shit and call cops. End of year. Statement given. Packing. Notice something in Flubber and Black's old room. Leather book. Ah 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 um, bop. Open it. Hyper accurate ink drawings of dead shit, with labeled and diagrams on how to properly sacrifice shit to Satan. The whole 200 plus page journal is full. The mouse, the pack rat, squirrel, the porcupinum the dog, a deer we never found. Last page. Picture of me and my friend. Notes say at night, when mom's asleep, when he comes to yell at me. Should be smart about this. Drawings of what my guts would look like on the outside. Last nope of the year. Friend asks if he can keep book. Sure. Never gonna bring this up again. I assume he still has it. Saw Flubber last year working at a bar I free Kyent. Said her son ran away four years ago. Wound up in jail two years ago. Wouldn't say what for. Ask her if she knew what Black wanted to do to me. Told me, of course, I was smart. Drinks to go. I love wild camping in England, but I can't do it often because I don't live near a place where I can get to easily. Cumbria is my go-to place if I do get the chance. The only creepy story I do have takes place in Grisdale Forest, just east of Coniston Lake. Still a camping newbie and paranoid about bumping into dangerous animals slash people. Decide to take my old ass dog, 13, mostly staff cross other breeds, because it'll give me peace of mind that shit will stay away if it smells her, well. Shit. Walk uphill a hundred meters or so and find a nice little stream to camp next to so I don't have to bugger about looking for water. Old ass bitch won't calm the fuck down, keeps doing half barks, the uff noise. I set up my tent and have a meal with my eyes peeled, can't see shit though. About 7 pm and not long left of sunlight so I decide to do a little perimeter. The dog is healed the whole time with its eyes darting about, still can't see shit. Ack, fuck it. I walk back to my tent after a good half hour or so looking. Decide it could be people pissing about close by so I cover my tent and keep the fire mostly embers that night. I climb into the tent with the dog thinking, it's going to be hard folly dash. Insta sleeping. Twig snap. I think I somehow pulled a muscle in my face because my eyes opened so fast. Slight night vision because of a clear sky, I can see my dog's outline stood at the tent door. She is breathing really heavily. Footsteps outside the tent get closer and closer. Feels as though there is a person walking right past the tent. Sudden howl from in the distance. Footsteps don't stop, going right past me. More howls in the distance. Footsteps still don't stop. Dog whines. My anus clenches so hard it puts most commercial nutcrackers to shame. The footsteps instantly stop at the same time I hear caveman like ugh slash arg coming from the passerby. 
So I guess this is how it ends. Footsteps are heard again. This time it's a lot louder and faster. Bruh that bitch is running. Towards me. Fuck fuck fuck. Grab kettle, had I knife but I'm apparently retarded. Before I get time to move my torso the tent gets hit. I get hit in the side along with the tent. It's a one man tent so I'm pretty fucking stuck. Feel a hand on my thigh grab then push off. Another caveman noise you walk. Dog snarls a fucking menacing one. Thud thud splash. Ah, ugh splash splash. All of this is followed by an squelching noise lost into the distance. I think. I think I'll get out of the tent now. Spend rest of night curled up next to fallen tree with dog and kettle. The morning after I packed up all my shit and headed home. I was planning on heading out that day anyway, I'm so glad though. After the long journey home I figured my dog scared a guy and he ran into my tent in the dark, I'm not sure if that's more comforting. I remember that thread, IIRC it was a general nope thread. People got on him for opening the door with or without a gun, I do unknow really. Sorry I'm not much help. As for wood stories, I got one. B12. Boy Scouts. Camping in open woods every other weekend. Fun as shit. Sleeping one night. Sharing tent with my best friend. He wakes me up. Sounds scared shitless. Anon, do you hear that? What? Hear faint chanting from behind tent, where a large dense area of trees is. Holy hands of Christ. We are silent as fuck. Chanting gets louder. Louder. They get closer. Closer. Sounds like they are right in our campsite. I'm too scared, I'm in my sleeping bag eyes forced shut. Chanting suddenly stops. But I hear scuffling out suet. Fuck it, it's a chipmunk I tell myself. Go to sleep. No one believed us the next day. There were lots of footprints around camp but we shrugged that off since, yeah no, campsite and such. In a woods thread? Be me. Decide to take winter camping trip. Me a bro we will call R and my GF whom we will call M go up into the mountains in Northern Cali. Snow so pure like you never seen. Took my K5 blazer and R suburban. Me and M and blazer, R and bourbon. First night goes as planned. Clear spot for fire and chill with some wieners. Me and M retire to Blazer for some backseat bumpin'. R says goodnight and gets in bourbon. Leaves fire lit so we have some light in case we need to piss. After me and M finish she asks what happened to the fire. Pitch black outside. Hear high pitched squeal. M freaks out. Grab my 38 from under passenger seat. Step out and attempt to light fire. Here are from behind me. Why do you want to light it again? I'm a dot docs. You left it lit for a reason you moron. Here coughing hacking vomit noises from about where my K5 should be. Fire finally lights. Thank you all based the easiest dot gif. Turn to my K5 and see what looks like a brown bear with your legs and dantlers. Nope to the bourbon. Forget about M for a bit. Shit I remembers. Call her. Still freaking out. She answers. Thing is gone from my roof. Run back to K5 like a ninja. Don sleep plan to get out tomorrow. Pick related, what my K5 kinda looks like. Lived in a small town called Sitka, Alaska. Bunch of fucking stupid native stories get told. One of those is called the Kushtaka. Decide to drive out to a small island to party with some old high school friends. We get out there set up, light the bonfire and crack open the alcohol. We have an amazing party for about 4 hours. All of a sudden we hear a loud as fuck squeal. Everyone kind of stops, what the fuck was that? Oh well fuck it, alcohol. Continue partying, we have music playing but it's getting kind of late, people are leaving. Too drunk to boat home, better wait until tomorrow. Set up a tent, next to our friends and get comfy. Lying down for the night, the fire is still slowly burning out. Can't really sleep. Lay there for a couple hours. 
look outside and see the shadow of like a person. It walks into the woods assume it's just my friend going to take a piss. Decide to get up, fuck it can't sleep anyway. Didn't bring my phone so go to grab my friends in his tent. Open up his tent. He is laying there sleeping. What the fuck? Then who was? This point the fire is barely emitting a glow. Get a little spooked, but fuck it alcohol. Go down to the beach to see if any more boats came or if it's just us. Check with flashlight, nope just us. Fuck it, better go see who it was then. Follow it into woods. Using my flashlight, shouting hello. Lots of people get lost and go missing around here you never know. Hear another loud as fuck screech. Honestly I can still remember the sound of it today and it fucking terrifies me just thinking about it, I have goosebumps writing this, I don't think green text does this story justice but I suck at writing so. Anyways continue onward into forest because fuck it alcohol. Shining flashlights through trees see what looks like a person walking through. Well what the fuck, it's obviously a person just fucking with me. Start chasing after them. For everyone thinking I am retarded for doing this I was heavily drunk that night and I regret it myself. Chase after them. Didn't see where they ran to. Look back I'm pretty far from camp, can barely see the glow of the campfire as it dims more. Well I can still see it so let's give one more search. Come across some tall grass field like pick related. Shine flashlight across. See something just fucking standing there. Scream out asking hello, or something like that can't remember too well. By this point I look back and see the campfire is going down faster. Start backing away or running, can't remember, from the figure freaked the fuck out. Start walking back to the camp. Nothing happening for a while. Campfire dies forest just goes dark. Nothing but a little flicker of light where the bonfire was. Start sprinting towards it. I can hear things running around me. Can't, sorry it's taking so long to type, I'm trying hard to remember details. Sprinting back. Can't hear running near me anymore, assume I'm clear. Shine my flashlight around me. Shining through the trees nothing. All of a sudden I hear a loud as fuck whistle like someone blowing a gym whistle above me three times. Literally ear shattering loud. Shine flashlight up looks like a tall as fuck monkey in a tree. Fall down and start crying and screaming for my friend. At this point I'm not too far from camp and thankfully he hears. He grabs his gun and flashlight and starts coming towards me. The fucking whistle thing starts again. I cover my ears. He signs a flashlight down through the trees. Keep in mind this next part is what he told me, I have no idea if he is bullshitting or not but due to what happened to me I'm inclined to believe him. He describes it dropping from the tree and growing taller before running off. He said that he at least got one shot into it and it turned around and made a screaming sound. Fuck it I'm leaving drunk or not. We get in boat and return. We tell everyone what happened, bullshit is promptly called. Decide to google what one native guy said. I see the Kushtaka wiki page and shit myself. So yeah, fuck camping in southeast Alaska ever again, sorry the story didn't have a better ending. Search Kushtaka on Wikipedia. The Kushtaka saved the lost individual by distracting them with curiously otter-like illusions of their family and friends as they transformed their subject into a fellow Kushtaka, thus allowing him to survive in the cold. However, Kushtaka legends are not always pleasant. In some legends it is said the Kushtaka will imitate the cries of a baby or the screams of a woman to lure victims to the river. Once there, the Kushtaka either kills the person and tears them to shreds or will turn them into another Kushtaka. Dude, you almost got turned into a furry. <laughs>